Greetings. This is TK Trav, aka Travis Magus, here with LBX 777. It's a good evening. Tonight we're going to go over the chapter 3, Yantra, Maps of Consciousness, in the book Mantra and Yantra by Swami Niranjan Ananda Saraswati. Now, these books are really important for someone who considers himself a student of magic or someone who wants to understand spiritual principles and how to use them effectively, right? Because books like this get straight to the point and describe exactly what these concepts mean and what they're intended to mean, not with superstition, but based upon history, where it has come from, and also provable experience that you can test in your own laboratory. So books like this delivers information that doesn't require blind faith and blind belief. Books like this deliver information that you can test yourself to see if it's true. And if it's not true, then move along. But if you do find it to be true, now you have a better understanding of, of why we do things. So in the East, they're called yantras. But in the West, we might have heard of them as sigils, right? We work with different entities, different spirits, different energies, and across the board, we use different symbols and sigils to access these different energies. Well, this chapter hopes to provide a little bit of insight as to how that process works and why that process works. So hopefully you have this book. Hopefully you've already read the chapter. If not, then we're getting right to it. So hope everyone's having a good evening. We're about to get started. Naturally Nature, peace, peace. Good evening, good to see you. Steve West, Steve West, greetings, greetings. Ayende Webb, welcome. Zero, peace, peace. So, Mantra and Yantra, Chapter 3. Yantras, Maps of Consciousness. <laughs> Nuru, greetings, greetings. Okay, let's begin. Hope everyone's having a wonderful evening. So life is good. Life is good. It should be should be enjoyed. Every moment that you have, it's best to experience it as now. And what I mean by that is not live in the future, not live in the past, but live in right now. Believe it or not, a lot of people have, have trouble with that. A lot of people cannot help themselves from gravitating into the past or dwelling on things that happened and then trying to forecast the future. And here's the thing about living in worry, right? Here's the, here's the crazy thing about living in worry. Spend all that time uh, focused on the negative as far as what may happen tomorrow, what may happen next month, and you don't even know if you're going to live past the day. So imagine having wasted all that time worried about what ifs and what may have happened and <laughs> you don't even live that long to see it. <clears throat> Enjoy what you got today. Enjoy what you have today. All right. Bell Rodriguez, welcome, welcome. Society Ejects, peace, my brother, peace. ZJ, greetings, greetings. Serious suit triple eight. Peace, my brother. Peace. All right. Ah, I forgot the clip. I gotta go grab the clip. Oh, almost had it. Almost had it. Meta Netta. Peace, peace. Where is that clip? There you are. Attached to my other camera. Give me just a second. We're about to get started. Hold on. Got it. 
It's a good day. It's a good day. Straight Panther, peace, my brother, peace. All right, so we're about to dive into chapter three. If you're just joining us, you know the deal. Go ahead and hit that like button because it helps this mindless algorithm know what to do with content like mine. And what should it do with content like mine? Well, share it, of course, with other people who are seeking this kind of information. It's hard to find good information on YouTube. You guys should know after years and years of searching. So liking my videos helps someone else come across it a little bit easier. Let's flip the camera around and get started. Mantra and Yantra by Swami Niranjan Ananda Saraswati. We are now covering chapter three. Yantras, maps of consciousness. Mobi, peace, peace. That's on page 37. Wow, turned right to it, fantastic. Dicky, peace, peace. That's a good line right there. Only when the attention span has increased can one move into the experience of the mantra. One cannot move into the experience of the mantra instantaneously just by repeating or chanting. So last time we were here, we went into the science of mantra and we talked about the vibration, right? And how these beige mantras represent pure vibration. They're not simply words, right? Um, these mantras aren't necessarily words that have to be translated in English and understood by the conscious mind. That's not the point at all. What has actually happened is something that we didn't even consider. Going through the actual practices of yoga and becoming purified in your awareness and purified in your level of attachment, purified in how you see the world, right? These aren't people that are worried about the president and what war is going on. They're not worried about bills. They're not worried about the basic human things. They're strictly focused on the unity of divine consciousness. That That's all that they consider all the time, right? So someone like that, if they're able to be still and go within, all of their trauma, all of their, you know, the different things that the average person would have to deal with, they do not have an influence on their thought process, okay? So what I'm saying is we're dealing with scientists and seekers and uh, sad sadhaks, they're called, yogis, who aren't dealing with the day-to-day -day turmoil, right? They're completely purified in their awareness. Now, what's happening is as they go within, they're able to perceive the subtle vibration that essentially is, is the building blocks of reality. And when they perceive those, because they don't have all these influences of trauma, they're able to perceive them accurately and clearly, okay? Now, if, if you or I were to go within, everything that we perceive is going to be tainted by our past experiences, by our traumas, right? By the different things that have an influence on how we think, right? But just imagine if you were to remove all of your opinions, if you were to be able to remove all of your influences like that, you could see reality clearly. So going within and seeing reality clearly, they were able to perceive that reality is built upon specific vibrations. And when they perceived these vibrations, they were able to translate them into something that the average human mind can understand, right? So this is where we get these beige mantras like Kleem, Kreem, Shreem, Aum, Yam, Lam, Ram, Vam, all those beige mantras. They're not actually words that mean anything. They represent specific frequencies of vibration that are the building blocks of creation. And as he said um, a few pages ago, Right. A few pages ago, he mentioned something very key about these mantras. He said, mantras are vibrations which influence the elements. Right. So we're literally tapping into 
vibrations that influence the very building blocks of reality. So it's not simply words that translate into something for the conscious mind to understand. This is something that goes beyond the conscious mind. All right. So now we're going to get to the visual aspect of it. Mantras are the vibratory aspect of it. Now we're going to get into something a little bit different. Matthew Watson, peace, peace. All right. So let's get started. I got my whiteboard ready this time. All right. So here we go. Straight Panther 79 says, Shreem Brzee Lakshmi Money Mantra. That's a good one to tap into. All right. Yantras, maps of consciousness. The basic concept of mantra is, is that it is nada, subtle sound, vibration, which is the first manifestation of energy. Right? So the basic concept of mantra is that it is it's known as nada. Right? What is nada? Nada is subtle sound vibration, which is the first manifestation of energy. The way that energy manifests, it actually goes in a pattern from akasha to air to fire to water to earth. And that doesn't mean specifically droplets of water and pieces of rock. That represents the, the rate that it vibrates at. Right. So we use the words air, fire, water, earth to symbolize these rates of vibration, but they actually represent, um, you know, the, the, the speed and the direction of the vibration. So things that qualify as an earth element vibrates a whole lot slower than something that would classify as as fire. Right. If you, you can just look at actual fire and see how quickly it moves versus looking at a, a rock or a tree. It barely moves. It doesn't move, really. It moves extremely slow. So the classification from earth to water to fire to air to akasha represents the speed and the, the direction of vibration. Now, the reason I say that is because each of the five elements are also associated with one of the five senses, right? So that it also kind of classifies that rate of vibration with smell being associated with earth. So smell is the slowest. I'll go ahead and draw that diagram here. All right, so what we're dealing with here is the earth element, which would also represent smell. That's going to be the slowest vibration. And we've got the water element that represents taste, right? Then beyond that is the fire element. And the fifth sense that would be associated with that would be sight. Because when think about it, when there's fire, you can actually see light is produced by fire. Water carries flavor, taste, and of course, earth being hard and dense carries smell. Now, of course, we've got the air, which would represent touch. You can, you can, you know, air and wind and gas and things that move at the rate and vibration of air, you can feel it. You can't quite see it. You can't taste it all the time. You can't smell it really all the time, but you can always touch things that move at this speed. And of course, there's the Akashic element. And that represents sound. So manifestation begins up here, or in this direction at least. And as it becomes more physical and more dense, the first thing that you're able to notice about it is that you that it's a subtle sound. Now that doesn't mean that you can hear it with your ears, but it becomes a very intense vibration. Then of course we've got, as it slows down, it becomes uh, perceptive by touch. And as it slows down even more, it becomes something that can potentially be seen. As it slows down even more, it's something that could potentially be tasted. And eventually, as it becomes its slowest vibration, it can actually be smelled. All right. So that goes back to the first sentence that he said here. He says the basic concept of mantra is that it is not a subtle sound vibration, which is the first manifestation of energy. Right. So this is the direction, the direction that energy manifests. It's manifesting in this direction. Now, the first thing that you get is sound, all right? That's the first thing that you get. Society Eject says that chapter, March 19, it's, and it's three days later and 12 years later. 
Oh, damn, I didn't even notice that. What is today? Today's the 22nd. Holy cow. Holy cow. I swear I didn't do that on purpose. Look at that. <laughs> Three days and 12 years later. That's awesome. That's awesome. Everything happens in cycles, man. Everything happens in patterns. Really cool. Really cool. All right. So um, the basic concept of mantra is that it is nada, subtle sound vibration, which is the first manifestation of energy. It is a frequency of vibration, a frequency of consciousness, and a frequency of energy. All right. Azrael Walker, greetings. Azrael Walker says, right on time. Exactly. When you're living in the flow, when you're living in the center, you don't have to pay attention to what time it is because everything you do is on time. I had to learn that the hard way. No stress, no struggle. It's all perfect. All of it. All right. Is a frequency of vibration, a frequency of consciousness, and a frequency of energy. We perceive these three components in a mantra. The natural vibration of the nada, the evolute principle, the natural nada of the conscious faculty, self-acknowledgement. And the natural spandan, vibrations of the energy faculty. Okay, so let's, let's break that down so we don't get lost here. He's talking about vibration, he's talking about consciousness, and he's talking about energy, right? He's talking about consciousness, and he's talking about energy, all right? These three things, vibration, consciousness, and energy. He says, we perceive these three components in a mantra, the natural vibration of the nada, that's the evolute principle. And when he says evolute, we're, we're thinking about evolution, right? It's ev it, the evolutes. These are the five L of evolutes, right? So from Akasha to Vayu to Agni or Tejas to Va Apas to Prithvi. These are the evolutes, right? They, they evolve out of consciousness. They evolve out of Prakriti, matter. This is the process of evolution. From, from subtle, from, from high, vibr high vibratory rate down to a slow vibratory rate. These are the evolutes. So this is what he says here on page 37, all right? He says, uh, we perceive these three components in a mantra, the natural vibration of the nada, that's the evolute principle, right? The vibration, the vibratory rate, that's the evolute principle. And he says the natural nada of the conscious faculty, which is self-acknowledgement. And then he says the natural spandan, the vibrations of the energy faculty. Okay. These vibrations bring about a transformation in the normal sensorial human personality. How does it do that? By sensitizing the mind and awareness to experience the subtle inherent flows of energy. Read that again. These vibrations, they bring about a transformation in the normal sensorial human personality. They bring about a transformation in your normal five senses by sensitizing the mind and awareness to experience the subtle inherent flows of energy. So these mantras actually help to sensitize your perception. Because you got to think, if, you don't, if you've never done this stuff before, of course you don't know how to do it. Of course you can't make sense of it, right? If I were to tell you, oh, if you just repeat these magic words, right, things in your life are going to change. Of course, that doesn't make sense if you've never had an experience like that before. But what these mantras do is they begin to sensitize you so that you're able to perceive it. Think about an artist, okay? Someone who is not an artist, if you just give them a bunch of, of colors on a paint palette, they're going to see like, what is it, red, dark red, blue, dark blue. They're not really going to be as sensitive to the minor details. But someone who is an artist and who spends a lot of time with color and analyzing the differences between the different colors, oh, they can tell you all kinds of shades of blue. We're talking about periwinkle. We're talking about, uh, you know, 
hell, periwinkle alone. Who the hell knows what a periwinkle is? There's so many different colors of blue. Sky blue. Um, I, I haven't had my 64 Crayola crayon box in a couple of decades, so I don't remember all of them. But what I'm saying here is someone who is sensitized to a specific subject understands the minute granular differences. And see, this is what mantras are going to do. As you perform these mantras, they sensitize your mind and your awareness so that you're able to experience the subtle inherent flows of energy. There's always these subtle inherent flows. They're always there, right? You're not creating anything new. What you're actually doing is you're sensitizing yourself to be able to perceive them. Let me know if that makes sense. Because a lot of people talk about, you know, the spiritual stuff isn't real and they don't believe this and they don't believe that. Well, the person who's saying that has never had an experience. Their senses are very dense, right? They cannot perceive it because they're so dense. They only operate on their five senses. So you can't expect them to believe any of this stuff until they're able to sensitize their awareness, until they're able to sensitize their faculties. They're not going to be able to perceive these subtle flows. Right? We have different tools and different instruments to detect subtle vibrations. You walking around in your body, you're not going to pick up Wi-Fi signal. Your mind, your, your consciousness, your awareness isn't tuned to pick up and decode and interpret Wi-Fi signal. We have to have a machine to do that. Now, the machine itself, the router, right? Those of you who know how to do this thing, the router, it picks up on those signals and it breaks it down. Into, and it translates it into something that your gross senses can perceive. So imagine being so sensitive. <laughs> You could tap into the Wi-Fi with your consciousness. Wouldn't that be something? And maybe that's what we're working on with uh, Elon Musk's uh, hyperlink or whatever the fuck they're talking about. Of course, saying peace, peace. All right, let's keep going. Because this is going to get deep, I'm telling you. You're going to see something in here that's going to make a lot of sense and, and connect some dots that you've been looking for for a while. Trust me. Because it happened with me. Mantras are used to deepen concentration and to access the deeper realms of the mind. Mantras are used to deepen concentration and to access the deeper realms of the mind. You can't dig that deep unless you're built for it. The same way that you can't go to the gym and bench press 500 pounds. You literally have to work your way up to something like that. Likewise, right, this is no different. Mantras are almost like weightlifting, like bodybuilding, like strength training, resistance training. Nuru says, can you focus your attention on just the tip of one specific finger and hold attention there and describe the sensation? Right? How many people would give up on that after 30 seconds? How many people could actually sit there for a whole five minutes, 10 minutes? I bet you if you sit there for 10, 15 minutes, you'll start to pick up on something very subtle that you missed before. That's how this works. Nothing's hidden, y'all. It's always, it's always ever present. It's just that your awareness hasn't been tuned to the point to perceive it just yet. But here's the thing. You can certainly do it. You can certainly do it. That's why we're studying this book and these different concepts. Upon accessing the deeper realms of the mind, at first we are the observer the drashta. And after having observed and realized these inner states, we become the experiencer, the bhokta of these experiences. With mantras, we begin to see the subtle levels that exist within the dimensions of consciousness and energy. Mm. Once there is an understanding and an awareness of the vibrational dimension, we begin to experience it. The whole body begins to vibrate with that inner spandan, the mind vibrates with it. That is the experience of Ananda Maya Kosha. Oh boy. If you don't know what Ananda Maya Kosha is, Ananda Maya Kosha is one of the five bodies that uh, make up our, our existence, right? So dealing with the slow vibrating dense earth element, this represents the Anamaya Kosha. This is a physical body, okay? Now, you're saying everything here exists on all levels, okay? So on the dense physical level where your five senses exist, 
that's called this body is called your anamaya kosha, your physical body. Now, on a higher octave, dealing with the etheric plane, which is reality just operating at a, a higher frequency, a higher vibration, right? This is this body is known as the pranamaya kosha. Okay? Now at an even higher rate of vibration, this body is known as the Vijnanamaya Kosha. And even higher, this is known as the Manamaya Kosha. And even higher, this is known as the Anandamaya Kosha. Okay? And that's what he says here. He says the whole body begins to vibrate with the inner spandan. Right? The mind vibrates with it. That is the experience of Anandamaya Kosha. Boom. That's what he says right here. So when we talk about these higher realms of your body, it's not as simple as just thinking about, oh, I'm in my astral body. <laughs> it, it takes a sensitization to be able to experience that. Just like as a baby, you had to become sensitized to even experience your physical body. When you were in that womb, you didn't even have the faculties to experience the physical body. You had to slow your vibration to be able to come down into it. Now, as we've gotten older, We've gotten very much locked into this physical body five sense perception. Our, our, our consciousness now vibrates very slowly to be in tune and in alignment with this very dense physical body. Now look, this isn't just your body. All, all five of these layers make up the self. Just like you're not just your bones, you're not just your nervous system, you're not just your organs, you're not just your skin. You're all those different layers. Likewise, those layers continue outward past your physical, right? From your bones to your blood, right? To your muscles, to your nervous system, etc. You got your physical body, which is wrapped by the etheric body, which is wrapped by the astral body, which is wrapped by the mental body, which is wrapped by what they call the body of bliss, the soul, the Anandamaya Kosha. Check. Love, 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 peace, peace. Okay, so let me go back because he did say something key that I kind of just read through. So yeah, he's talking about the different, this is the process of understanding this stuff, right? This is the process of step by step. He says upon, so mantras, this is what mantras do. They're used to deepen the concentration and to access the deeper realms of mind because they're sensitizing your awareness right now here's now what it doesn't stop there it's not just about becoming aware of these deeper levels here's what's going on a upon accessing the deeper realms of mind at first we're the observer right so when you access those deep levels of mind the first part you become the observer boom doesn't stop there though after having observed and realized those inner states we become the experiencer right so first you have to become aware of the thing to experience it you see how that works? Otherwise, you don't acknowledge it. You just keep, you, you, it just passes on through. It doesn't register in your awareness. So first, you become the observer. Next, after having observed it and realized it, you become the experiencer of those experiences. So with mantras, we begin to see the subtle levels that exist within the dimensions of consciousness and energy. You're able to see the subtle levels that exist. So you're able to be still and concentrate for an extended amount of time you're not going to be able to see these levels we can talk about them and you can repeat what somebody else said about their experience with it but until you're able to sit still and sensitize your awareness you're not going to have your own experience with it you're not going to become the experiencer it's going to remain surface level so once there's an understanding of an awareness of the vibrational dimension we begin to experience it. Once there is an understanding and an awareness of the vibrational dimension, we begin to experience it. The whole body begins to vibrate with that inner spandan. The mind vibrates with it. That is the experience of Anandamaya Kosha. And it's a beautiful thing because once you begin this journey, once you go deep like that, it's very difficult to go back. How can you go back to it? You can't go back to ignorance. Once the light is turned on, you see everything in the room now. All right? Have you ever been in your room one time and turned on the light and saw a big ass spider in the corner? All right? Do you just lay back down and go to sleep? No, you know that thing is in there. Everything has changed. Everything has changed. You know that spider's in there. A big ass spider too. I don't mean a little bitty baby spider. 
You walk into your room and cut on that light and you see a big one. And then you you turn and you look again and it's gone. Right? Do you, can you do you just go back to sleep and lay down? No. No. <laughs> once you become aware of it, once there's an understanding of it, everything changes. So that's what it's like here. So th- th- again, th- this is this is you want to get away from the faking and just repeating and pretending, right? Because anybody can pretend and repeat what somebody else said. But here's that thing: like, uh, imagine you you talking to somebody and sharing somebody else's story and pretending like it's yours. Yeah, man, I saw the spider in my room, man. I had my whole reality changed once I saw that spider in my room. No, like it, the words don't even vibrate with reality. You just talking. But when you when it really happened to you, you can tell because the experience comes through your words, right? <laughs> you begin to relive it even as you retell the story. So, so it's not about just repeating the words that somebody else said. Get your experience. Get your experience. No secondhand experiences here. All right. So symbols of consciousness. Mantras also have a form, a shape called a yantra. So if you asked if that was your question, what is a yantra? Here we go. Mantras also have a form, a shape called a yantra. Okay. It is believed that every thought has a form. Every emotion, every desire, every mental expression has a form. And this is also talked about in the Kabbalah, right? In the science of Kabbalah, this is actually what's happening on these subtle planes. Right. See, we think that everything originates and ends here. This is only a reflection of all this up here. Right. All this up here. This is reality. This is this is just a copy of an imitation, a reflection of a reflection. Up at a unicorn. Peace and greetings. Right. The physical plane is only a copy of, of what's actually going on in these very subtle dimensions. And I say that because. Every thought you have, every feeling you have, every light, every inkling, everything that comes into your mind, it didn't start here. It started on a very subtle plane and made itself manifest. So every thought form, every thought has a form. Every emotion has a form. And just like as it comes to your mind, you perceive it, it can also be uh, back reverse engineered, basically. Right? It can, it can also be reverse engineered. You can tap into specific thought forms. Isn't that what we do with sigils? Isn't that what, isn't this an idea that the more that you learn about this thing right here, every time you look upon it, you start to, more, more information becomes unlocked, right? When you first saw this, it just looked like a couple of circles and lines. But the more that you learn about this, the more it begins to speak to you on levels that aren't even just logical, speaking to you through the abstract. This just goes to show how much potential is within these mantras. It's not simply a sound. It's almost like a thumb drive, right? You look at a little thumb drive and you stick it in the computer. Just looking at it, you're just going to see a little piece of plastic and some metal. But when that thing is tapped into, you, who knows how much information is really there? Sometimes when you take a thumb drive and delete stuff off there, it doesn't even, it st- doesn't even get deleted. Sometimes it's still in there. Likewise, this is what we're dealing with, these symbols, these sigils, these yantras. If you've got the proper software you can begin to unlock the code that's actually in the yantra, that's actually in the vibration. Because your eyes, as they look at this image, you're actually picking up a vibration and translating it into something that your logical mind can perceive. All right, let's keep going. Gerald Sombright, peace, bro, peace. Maximilian, peace, welcome, welcome. So yeah, if you didn't know, this is what a yantra is. Yantras also have a form, a shape. Excuse me, mantras also have a form, a shape called a yantra. It is believed that every thought has a form, every emotion, every desire, every mental expression has a form. These forms are sensorial in nature. Anything that is created by the mind is recognized by the senses and is sensorial in nature. Through your eyes, you see a form. The faculty of vision is actively recognizing that form. The faculty of vision, it originates from what we know as the fire element. And again, it's not talking about actual fire, but it's talking about a rate 
a vibration, a rate of frequency. So through your eyes, you see a form. The faculty of vision is actively recognizing that form. You hear a sound. The ears pick it up, and they are actively recognizing the sound. Each sense organ, while expressing its potential, indicates that there is a deep and intense sensory connection of the mind and gross senses with whatever we are experiencing. Each sense organ, while expressing its potential, indicates that there is a deep and intense sensory connection of the mind and gross senses with whatever we're experiencing. Look, there's a connection between you and your senses and the thing that your senses are picking up. There's a connection. The fact that you're able to see this unicorn pin and the blue and the gold, right? There's something within you that's able to recognize that. Nothing here is, is separate or disconnected. And see, this is part of the key of yoga. Yoga, which means union. Union, right? In, in the West, dealing with the OTO and, and Golden Dawn, Jack Parsons and all that, he, he talked about the oath of the abyss. That's when you really begin to unify your internal and your external experience. And it begins with understanding that everything that your senses perceive within what you're perceiving is a seed of what you are, right? You wouldn't be able to perceive it if something in you didn't already have it. So a lot of people talk about, well, how, how, how do these Goetia spirits work? How can I look at this sigil and automatically know what the demon represents? Da, 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 da. Well, we're dealing with something that's deeper than just what you know in your conscious mind. This is something that's going very abstract into deeper levels of yourself. See up here where it says deeper realms of the mind? Just like a computer comes pre-programmed with information so that it's able to work, your mind comes pre-programmed with information so that you're able to work. Let's keep going. So each sense organ, while expressing its potential, indicates that there is a deep and intense sensory connection of the mind and gross senses with whatever we are experiencing. Let me highlight that. They say this right here taps into the science of the indrias, right? If you if you if you're if you're following along with this yoga stuff, um, you have heard about the indrias, the karma indrias and the jnanandrias, the organs of action and the organs of perception. If we look at Tatwashuti, which is this book, you know what page I'm going to turn to. Somebody type it in the chat because I done said it a million times. <laughs> going once, going twice. Let's see who gets extra credit. Looking at this page here, you'll notice here, creation begins up here. Well, not even creation, existence is here, right? Pure energy and pure consciousness, the two halves of this dual universe, of this dualistic universe, right? Shakti and Shiva. And from here, we begin the evolutes. Now we learned earlier about uh, the willing force, the activating force and the knowing force. We learned about three different uh, Shaktis, right? We learned about Durga, we learned about Lakshmi, and we talked about Sarasvati. They also represented the three gunas. But anyways, let's continue. It's the veil of Maya that that hides from our awareness the knowledge of our omnipotence. The knowledge of our omniscience. Right? Omnipotence. Will, will, force. Unlimited force. Omniscience. Unlimited knowing. Right? Hmm. So the veil of Maya covers up our, what we would say, godhood, right? Our divinity. And under veils and continuous veils, we eventually get to manifest reality, <coughs> dense reality. And from here is created mind. Buddhi, we talked about higher self. Ahamkara, we talked about the ego, which is the identification aspect, me mind, I like this, I don't like that. And we that right there, it shapes and determines 
our personality and who we think we are. And this is all shaped and determined based off of memory, which is chitta. Alicia M, you got it right. Thank you. ZJ, you got it right. Page 45. If you don't have this book, go ahead and grab it and study this chart well. And manas is the, is the, the mind of the body. All those five senses that I talked about, the sound, the smell, the sight, the taste, the touch, all of that combined, all the input, the data that we receive here gathers up into one brain that's known as the manas. Manas receives all that data, all that info, and it relays it to ahamkara, which is ego. And ego says, I like that. I don't like that. This is me. This is not me. I want more of this. I want less of this. Chitta is the entire vibratory field of all memory. Some would call it the subconscious mind. Some would call it the Akashic records. But we build our experience out of this chitta. Bhuti is the highest self, which exists just outside of Bhuti. And this is our key to expand beyond the microcosm. But in order to deal with that, we have to first deal with ego. We have to first deal with body mind, right? Because many of us cannot resist our impulses. Oh, I must have sex now. Oh, I must eat food now. Oh, I must watch Netflix now, right? <laughs> now, all this to say we're getting to the indrias, right? We're talking about the 10 indrias. And I've mentioned this before many times, but repetition is great for learning. The 10 indrias are split up into two. They're the organs of knowledge, which are called the Jananandriyas. And by the way, Janana means knowledge. The next book that we're actually reading is called Janana Yoga. And that's going to happen in two weeks or so. So go ahead and grab this book, Janana Yoga. Swami Niranjan Ananda Saraswati. Same author. So yeah, the Jananandriyas organs of knowledge, and then the karmandriyas, which are the organs of action. The root word is karma. We already read karma and karma yoga, didn't we? So action and knowledge. As you can see here, the organs of knowledge represent the perception of sound, the perception of touch, the perception of sight, the perce or form, I should say, the perception of taste, the perception of smell. And the karmandriya is the organs of action, represents the organs of expression and speech, the organs of grasping your hand, the organs of movement, the foot, the organs of reproduction, the sex organs, and the anal region, the organ of ex evacuation. Right? So these make up the indrias. So let's go back to why I even brought that up. Each sense organ, while expressing its potential, indicates that there is a deep and intense sensory connection of the mind and gross senses with whatever we're experiencing. So in other words, you have the faculty to hear, right? And then there's something that's heard. There's a connection that exists there. It's, it, none of this is random. You hear what you're capable of hearing. So if I can play a song here and a basic average person can hear it and they're like, oh, that sounds good. But someone who's like a producer who works with music and knows how to shape sounds and craft sounds, you're going to pick up the subtle frequencies and different things. Oh, the hi-hat is too crispy. Oh, they need to, you know, the bass is taking up too much space in the lower, lower region, right? We're able to nitpick and pick out different things because we're more sensitized. You, you see what I'm saying here? Just like I said with the artist above, the average person is going to look at it and see blue and light blue. Whereas the artist is going to be able to look at it and see periwinkle, see cyan see teal, right? And, and know instinctively what the difference is. Or someone who sings, they're able to hit perfect pitch C just because they have the awareness inside of them. They're sensitized enough to be able to hit that perfect pitch. Whereas the average person, we, we can't do that. Hell, I needed auto-tune to do that. <laughs> I would sing it close enough and then slap some auto-tune on there. I'll be good to go. Whereas other people, they can naturally hit it because they're sensitized to be able to perceive that. You get what I'm saying here? All right, so... To move out of this sensory connection and identification is very difficult because the moment you do that, you lose body awareness. To move out of this sensory connection and identification is very difficult because the moment you do that, the moment you move out of the sensory connection and identification, right, what I just talked about, the ears to hear and the sound that the ears can hear, they're connected. The moment you move out of that relationship, you lose body awareness because that's what body awareness is. 
right? Body awareness is having ears to hear and the sound that is heard, eyes to see and the sight that is seen, a, a tongue to taste and the thing to be tasted. That is what it means to be inside of a physical body. You feel what I'm saying? Like that, that right there, that's not the totality of existence. The physical dimension, right? Malkuth, the physical dimension, this is only one tenth of manifestation. One tenth. That means that 90% of existence is outside of that. One tenth of existence is having a tongue to taste and something to taste, having an ear to hear and something to hear, having eyes to see and something that is seen, having skin to feel and something that is felt, right? Having a nose to smell and something that is smelled. All that is contained in this Malkuth area. There is so much more beyond it. Yet everyone is trying to determine what reality is based on that little bitty 10% of information. How many times have you heard, we only use 10% of our brains? Where do you think that came from? Well, it came from the same place that all knowledge comes from. The occult. We only use 10% of our brain, right? Because 10% of our experience is our physical experience and the translation of that, the interpretation of that. So outside of having ears to hear and a sound heard, outside of having eyes to see and a sight saw, outside of having a tongue to taste and something tasted, that because all that is body awareness. Beyond that, it's difficult because most people start to fall asleep. That's why you start falling asleep in your meditation because you're not used to existing outside of that state. Now this might be too deep for some people, I know, but if it's not too deep for you, just hang on because we're really getting into, into the whole explanation of how this magic works and how working with spirits and all that stuff work, how sigils work. This is it right here. You don't need to, an, another Goetia book. If you understand this one chapter, you don't need to buy any readings. I mean, but you know, do what you're going to do because hopefully you're having fun. But for my spiritual students out there, please catch this info. So he says, to move out of the sensory connection and identification is very difficult. Because the moment you do that, you lose body awareness. Yantras indicate a process of knowing and realizing by which one can overcome this sensorial body identification. Yantras are subtle archetypes, the inner symbols of consciousness. So you have to think, if you begin to lose body awareness, how the hell do you maintain awareness without a body? In the last chapter, I said something key before I even started this, right? Mantras are vibrations which influence the elements. That was one. And number two, what he said here that was extremely crucial is this. Only when attention span has increased. Only, only when your attention span has increased. There's no way to skip this, y'all. There's no way to skip that. Only when attention span has increased can one move into the experience of the mantra. One cannot move into the experience of the mantra instantaneously just by repeating or chanting. Why is that important? Why is it important to increase your attention span? Think about it. Say, for example, just randomly, you don't have a body. Now you're just floating out in the cosmos. How long do you think it's going to take before you go insane? I, I give you five minutes. I give you five minutes. Why do I say that? Because most people need those five senses to have something to cling on to, right? Because we're so used to the ego identifying everything for us. What would happen if, if you suddenly passed and you find your awareness floating out into nothingness? You're, you're desperately searching for something to cling on to. You're going to cling to the, the best thing you can find. And that's, for the most part, what causes reincarnation. Because you're going to cling on to memories that you never neutralized. Oh, I didn't get to have that Snickers bar. I didn't get to buy those Jordans. I didn't get to become a rock star rapper. Oh, I didn't get to have that threesome. Oh, I didn't get to do this, do that. All those different thoughts are going to cause you to build images, to cling on to. That's what causes reincarnation. Let me know if you follow. Let me know if this doesn't sound correct. Let me know if this doesn't resonate. But anyways, losing body awareness, it's going to be very difficult for most people to, to maintain. Therefore, yantras indicate a process of knowing and realizing by which one can overcome this sensorial body identification. 
Yantras are subtle archetypes, the inner symbols of consciousness. I had my breakthrough working with the Goetia when I realized that when I went deep into meditation working with these spirits, I started to fall asleep. When I stayed focused on the sigil, I was able to go into my sleep with that sigil and I was able to touch what that sigil represented. I hope you catch what I just said there. Most people just fall asleep, call it a day and say, oh, I think I did it. But no, that sleep is actually a barrier. That's a barrier. There is a barrier here. As your awareness expands, see, there's an obvious barrier here. But if you were to fold this, and with, with Tifreth being the center, this barrier would be here as well. This is the first barrier to cross. This is another and another, another and another. But that first barrier that you cross, it, and, and this is actually a path, right? And it's symbolized in the Tree of Life by the Universe card. Very difficult for people to even take that first step. So everyone talking about, oh, I astral project, da, da, da. Most people can't get past the very first path. And this is the path of extending beyond your five senses because most people fall asleep. That's what we do. We're so conditioned and used to laying down and going to sleep. What, you know what I'm saying? Once you become so relaxed and you lose your five sense awareness, you go to sleep. So unless you train yourself to maintain awareness past the point of losing the five sense awareness, unless you train yourself to do that, you're going to fall asleep and, and you can't get past the first path, the first step. So when it comes to working with spirits and sigils, the sigil helps you to cross that barrier and make it into Yasad, which is the realm of imagination, the etheric plane. This is the realm that is represented by the water elements, right? I talked about the rate of vibration, the rate of frequency, the dense aspect of reality, and it gets less dense, less dense, less dense until eventually there is no density. So the very next realm, it isn't just going to sleep and dreaming. It isn't just wild and free imagination. When this imagination is directed with intent, there are actual specific places here and specific effects that can be had on this physical plane because the physical plane only follows the planes above it, right? It only follows the planes that are above it. Let's continue. So, yantras are subtle archetypes, the inner symbols of consciousness. So, yantras are the shape of a mantra. Yantras are the shape and the form of a mantra. First level of symbols, sensory inputs. All right, we're going to start basic and we're going to get a little bit more complex. So the first level of symbols, sensory inputs. By the way, if you are learning something, if you're appreciating this content, if this is something that you want to hear and you're very interested in, hit the like button if you haven't hit it already. Like I said before, this helps the algorithm, which doesn't have a brain, it helps the algorithm sort my content into the category of content that people are looking for that they want to watch so i would appreciate it greatly if you did like the video first level of symbols sensory input in the early days of modern psychology young spoke about the symbols of consciousness he identified those symbols as different images that we perceive in times of relaxation or sleep or in the form of memories recollections and dreams hmm hmm symbols of consciousness and he identified those symbols as different images that we perceive in times of relaxation I have a feeling we're about to get into it we're about to get into it he called them symbols of the unconscious <clears throat> symbols of the unconscious but today, when we begin to analyze the symbols of the unconscious, we discover that they have many levels and layers of experiences. Mm -hmm. we, when we begin to analyze the symbols of consciousness, we discover that they have many levels and layers of experiences. ZJ says, I've been powerfully drawn to a certain symbol. I feel like it's been opening doors or shining light on this info. It has a mesmerizing effect on me. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
none of us have all the information on any sigil. So if you're working with a sigil, there is always information behind it that you, you haven't even breached the surface. As a matter of fact, this reminds me of a passage here in Mystical Kabbalah. And it should be here on page 14 or 15. Let me see which one it is. Because she's talking about symbols here on page 14 and 15. Um, let's look at verse 8. He says, there are a great many symbols. This is Mystical Kabbalah, by the way. The Unfortune. Page 14, verse 8, she says, There are a great many symbols which are used as objects of meditation. The cross in Christendom, the god forms in the Egyptian system, the phallic symbols in other faiths. These symbols are used by the uninitiated as a means of concentrating the mind and introducing into it certain thoughts, calling upon certain associated ideas and stimulating certain feelings. Hmm. The initiate, however, uses a symbol system differently. How do we do it, Miss Fortune? He uses it as an algebra by means of which he will read the secrets of unknown potencies. In other words, he uses the symbol as a means of guiding thought out into the unseen and incomprehensible. You see that? We're using these symbols as a guide, as a raft, right? As a ship, as a vehicle, as a device to traverse into the unknown. And when I say unknown, we're talking about unknown to the five senses. Because everything that you know with your five senses, this that's just level one. Everything you ever heard, everything you ever touched, saw, tasted, and smelt, all that is just level one down here. There's more. Because as soon as we leave body awareness, the first thing you do is fall asleep. Because your consciousness isn't trained to survive outside of five sense awareness. All right? Like I said, you wouldn't last three to five minutes. I'm telling you, unless you meditate regularly, unless you're unless you get comfortable with existing beyond the body, you won't you don't last long. That's just the way it, like, it's not even me talking down on you. That's just the way it is. The same way if we were to go out into track and I'm going to sit here and run next to a seasoned runner. I'm not going to keep up with him. I'm going to run out of breath in two minutes. Right. Likewise, let's keep going. Um, verse nine. And how does he do this, right? How do we use that symbol as a means of guiding thought into the unseen and incomprehensible? He does it by using a composite symbol. A symbol which is an unattached unit would not serve his purpose. In contemplating such a composite symbol as the tree of life, he observes that there are definite relations between its parts. There are some parts of which he knows something. There are others of which he can intuit something or more crudely make a guess. Reasoning from first principles, the mind leaps from one known to another known and in doing traverses certain distances, metaphorically speaking. You see that right there? Let me read that again. The mind leaps from one known to another known, right? You don't you don't know what this is, right? Yet, you know pieces of it. You see that man on a chariot and you see the color red. It wouldn't be hard to guess that he's going to war. You see the cross, automatically you have images coming up, right? Everybody knows what that cross represents. You see a baby, you see a man on the throne. Clearly that represents Christ, clearly. It also kind of looks like the sun. And if that looks like the sun, that kind of looks like Mars. And over here you got a man on a throne sitting there with a scepter in his hand and a crown. So you're seeing three kings, three kings, one king going to war, one king sitting at peace, and one king that represents Christ. You see a relationship there, right? Another relationship. This looks kind of like, like a penis. This looks kind of like a vagina. I wonder if there's a relationship here, right? Right here, you see three people. You see, if you were to be able to zoom in, you could see a, a, a man here, a naked man. Here you see a naked woman. Here you see a naked uh, androgynous hermaphrodite, right? You see these three different combinations three different combinations you might not know what this tree represents in total but look what she says look what she says here the mind leaps from one known to another known right you leap from one no you know what that is and you know what that is and in that leap you make a connection you know what that is you know what this is and this is so with that leap you start making connections 
The mind leaps from one known to another known, and in doing so, it traverses certain distances, metaphorically speaking. It is like a traveler in the desert who knows the situation of two oases and makes a fort. He knows, yeah, he knows the situation of two oases and makes a forced march between them, right? Stranded in the desert, if you know that there's an oasis over here with water, your walking is going to be a little bit more in confidence, right? It's not going to be like you're searching in vain. You kind of have an idea of where it is, so you can you can go about it more confidently. He would never have dared to push out into the desert from the first oasis if he had not known the location of the second. But at the end of his journey, he not only knows much more about the characteristics of the second oasis, but he has also observed the country living between them. Thus making forced marches from oasis to oasis, backwards and forwards across the desert, he gradually explores it. Nevertheless, the desert is incapable of supporting life. Think about that. If you have mystical Kabbalah, um, really, this chapter three is really, really good. Really, really good. That, that's going to tell you how we use the symbols of the tree of life and, and magic in general or spirituality in general. Like this apply doesn't matter what you call it. It, it applies across the board. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. If it's too much to pretend like you understand, you'll get it eventually. And if you already understand, bear with me because we're about to traverse a distance. And if you accidentally found yourself here, consider yourself blessed and highly fortunate with good karma. And that's all I have to say about that. So we're talking about Jung. We're talking about him identifying um, symbols of consciousness and different images that we perceive during times of relaxation, right? He says that these pop up in our sleep in the form of memories, recollections, and dreams. How the cheetah is shaped. He calls them symbols of the unconscious. But today, when we begin to analyze the symbols of consciousness, we discover that they have many levels and layers of experiences. That actually wasn't the quote I wanted to read by Dion Fortune. Um, the quote that I wanted to read was about how um, symbols contain so much uh, information, especially when they're used and built up over many, many years by different initiates. It almost becomes like a, a, a cosmic message board. Um, I'll find it eventually. But anyways, let's keep going. The first symbols to be realized, seen, or visualized are sensory experiences which the mind perceives in the form of symbols. Often, people relive the events of the day or of the past in dreams. The events or memories that leave their definite impressions in the consciousness are called archetypes. Useful info, if you have this book. Go ahead and highlight. The events or memories that leave their definite impressions in the consciousness are called archetypes. Samskaras, right? <clears throat> These are sensory archetypes, and during sleep, something triggers them so that the sleeper begins to see them as dreams. Sometimes the thought is enough to trigger them. Sometimes a particular stress level in the personality is enough to trigger a recollection of an event. Whatever we see, first is the sensory input. That is the first level of symbols. Oh yes. Oh, yes, Gerald Sombright. Let's continue. The senses communicate through speech and through movement. We communicate through speech and movement. I am talking and at the same time, I am moving my hands. You are listening and you are watching this movement. All our life, we express ourselves by speech and movement in order to recognize, connect, or describe our perceptions to others. It's true. Jeez Louise. If I didn't have to sleep and I could do this 24-7, you better believe I would. <laughs> 
All our life, we express ourselves by speech and movement in order to recognize, connect, or describe our perceptions to others. Speech and movement become the archetypes of the senses in the unconscious mind. Everything that is experienced is being stored in the unconscious, like in the hard drive of a computer. Everything that is experienced is being stored in the unconscious, like in the hard drive of a computer. Again, if you don't understand what's going on here, just listen. It's being stored in the hard drive. It'll make sense. Believe that. Whatever we store in a computer remains there till we retrieve it. However, even if we delete the information and clean the entire hard drive, it is still possible to extract the deleted information from a blank or cleaned hard drive. I've done that before, so I know that's true. The information remains in the form of electronic, laser, or magnetic impressions, or some other form. The information remains in the form of electronic, laser, or magnetic impressions, or some other form. In the same manner, it is not possible for a person to fully delete everything from the mind as some impressions will always remain. Therefore, even though you may believe you overcame a situation many months or years ago, it will suddenly flash before you and you will again experience the same memory and emotion, sentiment, feeling, thought, or mood. Right? Right? Those of you who are, are in my course, you know what I'm saying? We've been doing some of these meditations and hasn't this been happening, right? When you really break that barrier of sleep and get out of body consciousness, what is there but these memories, these impressions, those are the first layer of experience that we come across, right? And I, I even said it in the class, memories that I thought that I had dealt with and completely absolved begin to pop up. Stuff from middle school, stuff from elementary school, stuff from my childhood would begin to pop up. They're still there. They're always there. They're always there. When I went to my grandfather's funeral this weekend, I began to see family members that I haven't seen in decades. And just seeing their faces began to trigger memories that I completely thought I forgot about. All this information is always there. From where did it come? Something you thought you had worked through? Suddenly you realize that the remnant, the tail, is still there, and that is the archetype. The memories, visual inputs, and sensory inputs become archetypes. And this gets deeper. T-Dog, peace. Nonverbal symbols. Another range of symbols is nonverbal. Nonverbal symbols are beyond the scope and range of the senses and represent the building blocks of the personality. Something to highlight and read again at a later date. Look, if the book cover has the words Swami Nir and John Ananda Saraswati on the cover, that might as well just say, Several gems and fire emojis are about to be dropped. If you see this on the cover, you already know it's time to buy a box of highlighters. You already know. Don't take my word for it. They are not what we receive, understand, or analyze through the senses, but what we have come with in this life in the form of our character, nature, behavior, personality, attitude, and mentality. Remember him talking about this in Karma and Karma Yoga, the last book that we read, because all these are going in order? Remember that when he talked about how the computer comes pre-installed? MC Maestro says, Swami Nirnjanananda and equals instant banger. Precisely. Precisely. That's like if you if you if you're trying to come up with a song and you want it to hit the top 20, top 10 charts, you're gonna have to get a feature. Got to. I don't know any modern artists, so no example. You guys know somebody that, who, who's somebody that's hot right now that you can put on the song and instantly have a hit?
Thank you, Maximilian. Okay, so these nonverbal symbols, these, these are what we come pre-equipped with. <clears throat> okay, like you said, they're not... Okay, yeah, I'll take that. MC Maestro says he's like Lil Wayne back in 2010. Yeah, see, I remember that. I remember that. I couldn't go a day without hearing Lil Wayne's voice. Gerald Sombright says Drake. Okay, so it's still Drake. Last I checked, it was Drake. Damn, nobody come out since then? Oh, well. So these nonverbal symbols are beyond the scope and range of the senses and represent the building blocks of the personality. They are not what we receive, understand, or analyze through the senses, but what we have come with in this life in the form of our character, nature, personality, attitude, and mentality. Al Dickey says Migos. Okay. Vaguely. Yeah, is, is that the, um, what's that dude's name? What's that dude's name? I think Quavo. Yeah, I've, I've heard the Quavo guys. Is he a part of that group? I'm pretty sure. I can confidently guess that. <laughs> Migos. All right. As a person, you came with certain qualities and limitations. Those qualities evolve, and the limitations also evolve. You experience yourself now with both your shortcomings and strengths. However, you don't know what your strengths or shortcomings are until you recognize the archetypes or samskaras, right, right, which have made your personality what it is now. Okay, now let's get to this third category, all right, because we're going in order of increasing impact and influence. Depth of influence, I should say. So the first type <clears throat> that he talked about were sensory inputs. Those are the first level of symbols, sensory inputs, and that's everything that you collect with your five senses, right? Stuff that you saw, stuff that you heard, stuff that you taste and smell, all that stuff is collected in your, in your unconscious mind, right? The events of the day doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. All that stuff has been collected and stored. So when you go to sleep, some of those uh, sensory input data collections pop up again as dreams, pop up as memories, right? He says the events or memories that leave their definite impressions in the consciousness are called archetypes. The next level he talks about are the nonverbal symbols, right? Um, the nonverbal symbols, like you said, these come pre-equipped with your personality. These are what make you who you are. You didn't do anything to get these. Well, rather, not in this lifetime. They came with you from, from a past incarnation. All right. Now we're getting to transcendental symbols. So check this out. Transcendental symbols, the third group of archetypes, is transsensorial. That means they're beyond the senses. Not only are they transsensorial, but they're also transcendental. They are the maps of consciousness, yantras, geometric forms that were visualized by yogis in deep states of meditation when they tried to experience and understand the subtle vibrations within their own bodies and the cosmos. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Doesn't that look a little bit like a fractal image? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, once you start to get an experience of these archangels, when you start to get an experience of, of these angelic entities and the stations of the Briatic realm and the Briatic realm and the Yetzeratic realm of existence. They don't look like circles with a bunch of eyes on them and a million wings, right? That's somebody who, who hasn't uh, purified their, themselves as they, as they reach these levels. This is somebody who just looked at a comic book and a meme. When you really have started to clarify yourself, these things are going to become uh, apparent to you in the form of different shapes and what looks like fractalized images. Just imagine something like this, but 3D, three-dimensional, or hell, four-dimensional, honestly. Imagine this, rotating and expanding and moving and gyrating. That's what these entities look like, but they're not, they're not people with thoughts and ideas. They represent pure standing waves, perfect vibrations that are, that are, are supported and sustained by themselves. Again, don't take my word for it. 
as you practice this and begin to do these meditations yourself, you're going to start to see it. I didn't make this up. I didn't make that up. But that really became clear to me after this book right here. Kabbalistic Concepts goes even deeper. William G. Gray, same author. If you read Kabbalistic Concepts, it's going to go even deeper. When I read this, that's when it really clicked for me, um, experiencing these entities as these fractalized images. And, and, and you're going to be forced to see them if you take high dosages of psilocybin mushrooms or even uh, LSD. Because that's what exists in these subtle planes. All right? These repeating patterns. People call them machine elves or whatever, but there are, those people also don't study Kabbalah and, and yoga. But I do, so f him and f you too. Peace, Frame Star Films. Mm. MC Maestro says Shem Hamefrash sigils in 4D. Oh my goodness. Gem sigils in 4D, he says. Right. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yes. Hell yeah. Perfect. So the third group of archetypes is transensorial and transcendental. They are the maps of consciousness, yantras, geometric forms that were visualized by yogis in deep states of meditation when they tried to experience and understand the subtle vibrations within their own bodies and the cosmos. Greetings, XNSWKKW. The price I want for a show, you're gonna need three promoters. I got the body from Jim Ellis, but I switched the motor. Yeah. Yeah. What they heard were mantras, and what they saw were yantras. At this level of consciousness, the impressions or symbols are transsensorial perceptions. Yo. What they heard were mantras, and what they saw were yantras telling you this is where that where the science of goetia came from didn't come up didn't didn't happen in europe right this stuff came from the east just like in this book here um the sri sandari lahiri the descent in the back of it there are 103 different sigils with an associated mantra that conveys a specific result. All right? Sounds a whole lot like what happened in the Goetia and the Shem Hamifrash, right? You got the specific sigil that you visualize. You got a, a, a mantra to repeat with it, and they do a specific result. Discovery of hidden treasure and wealth, right? Don't that sound like some Goetia? Immunity from infectious diseases such as smallpox. Power to gain tremendous popularity. Bestowal of desires. Don't that sound like some, don't that sound like some, some Goetia? Power to attract the person you love. Citri, right? This gives you a mandala to focus on. This gives you a mantra to, to say. This gives you the number of times to repeat the mantra. This even gives you a sigil associated with it. And look, this is far older than the Goetia. This is so old, right? This is the oldest um, that I have seen so far of using sigils and mantras to produce a specific effect, right? I'm trying to tell y'all. I'm trying to tell y'all. Why settle for the copy when you can get the original? The price I want for a show, you're going to need three promoters. Yeah. 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 Let's 
Let's keep going. MC Maestro says, what if you evoke the SL sigils? Worth a try. I've worked with two so far. I've worked with two so far, and I can say that most definitely I've gotten results. Now, that may be because, you know, I've had prior experience with Goetia, but... I mean, shit. Yeah. Definitely. Give it a... Get, pick one. You know what I'm saying? Just like the Goetia. If any of you do have the Sri Sundaria Lahiri, go to the back and look at all the different ones. Then read the associated chapter with it. There's a channel on YouTube that um, has the video has a video of him singing each verse and you can just put that bad boy on repeat you know what i'm saying since we learned that there's four different ways that you can do mantras including listen to it listening to it all day in the background put it on repeat it's an easy way to tackle the 2000 1000 repetitions what i would do is i would take it and put it on two times the speed and i sat there and calculated how many hours i had to listen to that in order to reach 2000 repetitions including the eight hours of my sleep for the particular one that I chose, I think it was number three. It, yeah, sloka number three. It took me, I want to say, eleven hours a day. I had to listen to it. So I listened to it while I slept, and I also listened to it throughout the day. I even just lost count. I just had it playing all day long. Right. I had to get it. And see, Marshall says, "Damn, I was thinking two times was cheating." Yeah, man. I put that thing on two x speed. Put it on repeat. I had it on my phone, on my earbuds, on my speakers, just playing all day, every day. I can't stop hearing it now. Like, it's playing automatically in my head. But that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's probably why it worked. See, and I even wrote down, like, how I say it so I could say it right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't focus on the spelling. I just focused on the, uh, what's it called? The phonetic. You know what I'm saying? And then as, as far as in the song, when he would go down or go up with his tonality. But yeah. That one's shloka number three. And this one certainly uh, came through. Press a one for sure. You go need three promoters. I got the body from the Millers, but I'll swing the motor. Bum, bum, bum. Gang. Chillin'. Vibin'. Shloka number three. All right, continue, continue. So what they heard were mantras and what they saw were yantras. At this level of consciousness, the impressions or symbols are transsensorial perceptions. Yantras were also seen when the yogis tried to visualize the formless supreme element. What is the vision of formlessness? It is when, instead of an imagined material form, you experience its essential element. Remember we talked about the essence of a thing versus the expression of a thing, right? Most everybody's focused on the expression of a thing, but it takes a wise mind to look past the surface level and look at the essence of a thing, because the essence is where the expression comes from. So what he said here was, what is the vision of formlessness? He says, it is when, instead of an imagined material form, you experience its essential element. So that right there tells you the, the, the form of a thing is not its essential element. What do they say? Never judge a book by its cover? You literally have to read the book before you can decide what it's about. Likewise, that goes for everything in, in experience. And we talked earlier about the concept of the indriyas, the ten indriyas, the karmendriya and the janandriyas. How for every, for the for the capability of of smelling, right? For the capability to smell, there's an associated 
thing to smell. Everything that can be seen, there's a corresponding faculty within the perception, within the, the capability to see, right? In other words, everything that can be experienced with the five senses, it, it's all self-contained, right? This entire five sense experience, physical reality is self-contained. But that's only 10% of existence. 10%, which means that there's layers and layers beyond that. So what we're experiencing here in this five sense reality, it's an expression of an essence. Nothing here is the essence. Everything that you see, touch, smell, hear, feel, it's the expression of an essence. So what does he say here? He continues to say, it is that which has not assumed a material form as of yet. Nevertheless, it exists. Very key. It is that which has not assumed a material form as of yet. Nevertheless, it exists. Tantra explains that the Shiva Lingam is a symbolic representation of the formless Shiva. While the image of Shiva as a person wearing a tiger skin with snakes coiled around his neck, the ganja flowing from his locks, uh oh, <laughs> is the representation of his manifest form. All right? In the same way, the image of Durga as a goddess is the representation of the manifest form of that aspect. But the Durga Yantra symbolizes the formless Durga. Keep that in mind. There's a difference between the expression and the essence. The expression comes from the essence, but it's not the essence. It's just an expression of it. The same way that water can express itself as you know, a mist or a cloud or raindrops or an ocean. None of those are actually water. All those things are expressions of what we know, what we know is water. Oh yeah. So the blue man that you see with the tiger skin, that's that's not Shiva. That's an expression of the essence that we know as Shiva. Likewise, the, the, the blue-eyed, blonde-haired guy hanging from a cross, that's not Jesus. That's an expression of Christ. You see the difference? You guys saw that show, uh, American Gods, where they were, uh, the, the, the episode where they were celebrating Easter. There was a different Jesus for every culture. There was a Mexican Jesus, black Jesus, white Jesus. The first instinct is to say, oh, that's fake. Jesus ain't real. But that, that's not what it's actually trying to convey. What it's conveying is there's an expression of a Christ essence. And that expression is shaped, molded, and influenced by the perceiver. Every culture has a Christ figure who looks like them, made in their image. That's just how we do it. That's just how humans do it. That doesn't mean that black Jesus is real and white Jesus is not. And, oh, he's actually an Arab. None of that stuff is what matters. That's just expressions by people who lived and who are dealing with the science. The truth should go beyond surface level. Let's keep going. That's literally the only lyric I know, and that's just because it was on Fortnite. Yantras are symbols of the formless, transcendental reality. How can you imagine that which is nothing? How will you contemplate that which you have never seen? What is the formless representation of water, H2 and O? two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. When two unite, they become water, whose form you can see. When they're separate, you cannot see them with the naked eye. In this case, the formula is formless representation. In the same way, a yantra is a symbolic representation of the eternal principle. Yantras can also appear in dreams when the mind has bypassed the senses and gross physical awareness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Anybody who's still stuck on Goetia stuff, this is your opportunity to figure it out. I say stuck because there's there's so much more past that. And maybe you're just starting out, or maybe you've been there for a couple years. But either way, this is how you do it. Don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. It's not magical, mystical, scary monsters in hell. It's literally symbols that represent an essence. That's all it is. That's all it is. Framestar Film says would be a good idea to create a Yantra tabletop altar or ritual space as it incorporates the four quarters and elements. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Tools for transformation. In the Indian tradition, the use of mantra and yantra is synonymous with bhakti sadhana. As mantra and yantra channel and purify the emotions and create a state of mind in which the aspirant can connect with the object of worship, the ishta. You ever ask and wonder how do yantras and mantras channel and purify your emotions? You ever wonder how that works, right? Yeah, think about it. The yantra and the mantra represent pure vibration, right? They represent something that already exists. Now, in your head and in your mind is a bunch of thoughts and feelings that are resonating and vibrating and reflecting based off of stuff that you went through and your reactions to them. That is impurity. Those opinions and feelings, that's considered impurity. Why? Because it's sinful? No, because it indicates attachment to matter and material existence. Because you have these thoughts and opinions and feelings, all that indicates attachment to physical existence. In other words, you're feeling and thinking these thoughts because you identify with the body. That's what it that's what the impurity is. So when you tap into these pure vibrations of mantra and yantra, they have nothing to do with an individual existence. They have nothing to do with opinion, nothing to do with how you feel, nothing to do with what you know, what you want to do. It's pure vibration of something that exists beyond just ego, right? These exist beyond ego. They were here before you were born and they will always be here. We're dealing with concepts that are universal, so much so that they represent the building blocks of, of existence. So if you're able to fill your mind and focus your, your awareness on things like that, you become purified at least in that moment because there is no attachment in that space there is no identification with matter in that space you now become one with if you do it right you become one with a pure essence an essence that exists beyond your individual expression like does that make sense you're beginning to identify now with something that is eternal you become one with something that is eternal at least for that time being so it says here, in the Indian tradition, the use of mantra and yantra is synonymous with bhakti sadhana, which represents the practice of worship, right? Emotional uh, worship. Filling yourself with these reverent emotions. Not, not worshiping a... It's not like what you think as far as like Christianity or something like that. You're not worshiping some person in the sky somewhere. You're, connect, you're using your emotions as a tool, right? Tools for transformation. You're using these intense emotions as a tool to connect with pure vibration and it becomes you you become it as mantra and yantra channel and purify the emotions and create a state of mind in which the aspirant can connect with the object of worship the ishta bhakti is a state of mind there are different states of mind jealousy hatred love compassion greed arrogance etc similarly similarly Bhakti is also a state of mind. The other states of mind connect one to the material world, whereas bhakti connects one with the object with one's object of inner identification. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want.
what I want. The scriptures have defined bhakti in many ways. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna describes bhakti as a process of positive and qualitative transformation of one's mental, attitudinal life. In fact, all the statements on bhakti emphasize the need to arrest the dispassions of the mind and focus it on the object of one's identification. The final state of bhakti is atma nivedan, surrender of the self. But its initial stage is positive and qualitative transformation of the gross, lower mind. This is achieved with the help of mantras and yantras as they create a connection with the supreme element. Gerald Sombright says, would you say that demonic spirits of the Goetia are just individual expressions of nature itself? I would absolutely say that. Yes, I would. Yes, I would. So honestly, we could take away the word demon, demonic, because really we only use that for search engines and, and because some of us know what we're talking about. But we could really interchange that word with other things. Because using that word scares people right off the bat. Oh, demons, right? But if we were to come up with a different word for it, it would be uh, uh, better understood by the muggles, if that's what we were trying to do. But yeah, I would absolutely agree with what you just said there. Individual expressions of nature itself. ZJ says, so to learn about ancient myths could help us learn these essences deeper. Absolutely. Because again, this is, this is what the ancient myths are trying to teach. All of the different gods and goddesses and all that stuff, they're representations of cosmic and natural forces. We personify them to give us a symbol, a yantra to focus on. So when people have dreams of the gods doing this and the deities doing that, that's us having an interaction with these specific essences. Alicia M says patterns, exactly. Patterns, patterns, just like the angels, just like the archangels or whatever you wanna call it. Those are just words, but we're dealing with cosmic patterns. Yes, yes. The final state of bhakti is atma nividan, surrender of the self. But its initial stage is positive and qualitative transformation of the gross lower mind. This is achieved with the help of mantras and yantras as they create a connection with the supreme element. The supreme element. Yantras are geometric configurations, right? Configura configuration of yantras. Yantras are geometric configurations, mainly constructed of triangles and circles. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> mainly constructed of triangles and circles. Ooh, ooh. I don't see nothing but triangles and circles. Crazy, crazy tasty. Triangles and circles, right? triangles and circles. Interesting. Triangles and circles, triangles and circles. Funny how that works. Coincidence? I think not. think not. Honestly, even these would be a representation of triangles and circles, right? You got two triangles here. You got two circles here. We can do it like this. Because it's sometimes drawn that way. Triangles and circles. Triangles and circles. Yantras are geometric configurations, mainly constructed of triangles and circles within a framework of squares. <laughs> the basic 
geometric figure in the yantra is the line. From the yogic and tantric perspective, a line is the only way of expressing the unknown. It is the symbol of space. From the line emerges triangles. There are two kinds of triangles in yantras, inverted and upright. The inverted triangle represents energy, and the upright triangle represents consciousness. Could that be why in Tatwashuti, the triangle that is often illustrated is pointing downward? Interesting, interesting, interesting. Because what did she just say there? She said that there are two kinds of triangles in yantras, inverted and upright. The inverted represents energy, which is what we're dealing with in Tatwashuti. The upright represents consciousness. I like that. Makes sense. But also keep in mind what he said earlier. He said the basic geometric figure in yantra is the line. Right? Because now we're starting to get Kabbalistic with it, right? If you remember the description of these shapes, as far as with uh, the shapes with what's happening with one being a point, two being a line, three being the triangle, right? Four being the square. We're dealing with Kabbalistic concept, concepts here. I guess if you really want to get with it, four would represent Doth, and Doth can include everything beneath it. So point, line, triangle, square. A line is the only way of expressing the unknown, right? So now we're talking about the path of the fool or the path of the mages uh, from Kether to Chakma, Hakma. A line is the only way of expressing the unknown, the path of the fool or the mages from Kether to Hakma. It is the symbol of space, right? Right? Hakma represents space. We're talking about Kabbalah here. Or Kabbalah is talking about Tantra, I should say, because this came first. From the line emerges the triangles, and that makes sense. That makes sense. From Kether to Shakma to Bina. There are two kinds of triangles in Yantras, inverted and upright. Ooh, check this out, check this out. So what does he say here? There are two kinds of triangles in Yantras, the inverted and the upright. He goes on to say that the inverted triangle represents energy and the upright represents consciousness. Boom. Boom. Do you see that? Do you see that? Breakthrough discovery. Somebody time stamp it. Because we done figured it out. We done figured it out. The upward triangle represents consciousness. The inverted triangle represents energy. Now it all makes sense. The three triangles. You see it? You see it? You see it? Maybe I'm alone in that discovery. MC Maestro says the evocation circle is very similar to the combined Tafas sigil. Yeah. Yeah. All the elements in one space. Aldiki says, could anyone tell me the name of the last book Trav held up with the mantras in the back? Yes. Okay, it looks like you found it. Cool. Chakras are the expression of these essences as well. Are there deities associated with them? Absolutely. There are deities associated with each one of the chakras. Absolutely. Stray Panther says the three gunas. Yes, yes. Upward triangle representing sattva. And the downward triangle representing rajas and tamas. Perfect. thumbnail that you had with Kanye West has an upward and downward triangle sent back in time. Hmm. Gotta check that again. Man. Love and light. Love and light. Gerald Sombright says, I'm convinced. I'm blessed. I also have good karma. You see? Tuned in at the right place at the right time. You already know. Wow. 
okay, okay. In the inverted triangle, the horizontal line above represents space. So in the inverted triangle, the horizontal line above, this one up here, represents space. The horizontal line represents space. The left line moving downwards represents time. All right, so th those of you guys who do know about Kabbalah, these the slightly advanced uh, people here on the stream, check this line out on page 47, right? Dealing with the three worlds of, well, not the three worlds, but um, the three triangles, right? The causal, the astral, and the individual. So she's ta he's talking about the structure of these triangles. Now, he said the upward triangle represents consciousness. The downward triangle represents energy. So what he's saying is that line going across represents space. The left line moving down represents time. And the right line moving down represents object. He who has an ear, let him hear what the hell's going on right here. Space, time, object. Space, time, object. Maybe this is too much to be given out right now. <laughs> Space, time, object. Space, time, object. Time, object. Time, object. Space. Let's see. Let's see how this works. Star Film says the five platonic solids are also part of this geometric mystery that maps these universal cosmic dimensional principles. Yes. Yes. Space, time, and object. Well, let me highlight that because I definitely don't have to go back over this. Space, time, and object. That which is recognized by the individual and lived by the individual. We are living in the dimension of time, space, and object. And that is the dimension of Shakti, represented by the inverted triangle. The dimension of Shakti. Look, and look how it's separated by the abyss. Man, y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't hearing me. Space, time, and object, the inverted triangle. This is where we live as an individual. This is the dimension of Shakti. Y'all need Swami Niranjana Nanda Nanda to say it. That which is recognized by the individual and lived by the individual. Up underneath that abyss. We are living in the dimension of time, space, and object. And that is the dimension of Shakti, represented by the inverted triangle. Space on top. Time moving down and sense object awareness moving down. Thus, the inverted triangle becomes the symbol of Shakti. catch it. You better catch it. The chakra system, chakra system, also represents this downward movement of energy from transcendental to gross, down from sahasrara, down through the different chakras to muladhara. This downward movement is towards what is binding, constricting, and confining. You are coming down into a confined state of senses, mind, consciousness, and energy. Big. Big keys. Big keys. Look, this stuff is the big keys because after you understand this, you don't have to buy a thousand books and you don't have to buy readings from nobody. It. All, all of it makes like this is the underlying info that this stuff is all based on. 
You won't need to, unless it's your goal to keep buying books after books after books every day, every week, every month, every year, unless that's just what you want to do. I kind of enjoy doing that, but if you're really trying to get to some understanding, this is it right here. You don't need too much more than these couple of books that I've been going over lately. Because I'm telling you, like, it's, it's one thing to study, to learn, yes. But if you're searching for an answer, you know, it should be for a reason. There's so much more to be done and to be worked with than just this basic stuff. Please understand this stuff right here. Kinsukeku asks, is that Tree of Life by Israel Regardi? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Tree of Life by Israel Regardi. Absolutely. Okay, check it out. Um, I'm on page 44. All right, if you got this book, hopefully you're reading along with me. I'll be right back. I'm taking a quick, 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 quick break. It's 9.59. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Not even like two minutes. Back again, like we had never left. Close him up like he had never been entered into before. Yes, Lord. Father God, we ask right now that you touch. <laughs> cool breeze, cool breeze. Perfect weather. Okay, thank you everybody for uh, hanging tight. Or whatever the phrase is, hang tight hang 10 or whatever. Anyways, here we are. Won't he do it? Amen. Amen. So we were talking about the triangles, the line across representing space, the left line down representing time, and the right line down representing object awareness. So let's talk about the upright triangle. <clears throat> The upright triangle of consciousness is defined in the opposite way. The flat line representing space is at the bottom, and the lines of time and object extend up and meet in space. Hmm. Uh, 
when the Shakti principle, the inverted triangle is active, then from the transcendental or pure level of existence, we come down to the confined lower level. When consciousness becomes active, the process reverses. Now our yogic and spiritual journey is upward. The Kundalini rises from Muladhara and goes up to Sahasrara. The upward journey is towards freedom and the downward journey is towards bondage. The triangles represent that journey. Ooh, so for most people, it looks like the Kundalini is flowing from top to bottom, top to bottom. That's why it's contained in Muladhara. So what we're working on is expanding our awareness so that that process reverses. Man, oh man. Man, oh man. He says that when consciousness becomes active, the process reverses. So we've all got the potential at all times, but consciousness has to become active. And he was talking earlier about the first step is becoming aware of a thing. The next step is experiencing that thing. It isn't until we become aware of it that we can experience it. So we have to do the work with the yantras and the mantras to expand our consciousness, right? And we got two levels to go now. Remember I said we're a copy of a reflection, right? So we've got quite a bit of expanding to do before we can activate consciousness and reverse the process of existence. Because right now, Energy is flowing downwards, downwards into the direction of bondage, he says. The upward journey is towards freedom and liberation. Sheesh. Man, this is good stuff. Come on, camera, focus. There we go. The circle is another component of the yantra. It represents the wheel of life, the circle of life and death. By the way, in Ladder of Lights, he talks about how Hakma represents the circle. Also, we learned that in a Kabbalistic guide, a, a, a guide to Kabbalistic symbology, or I should say, a practical guide to Kabbalistic symbolism by Gareth Knight. We did go over the chapter of Hakma. By the way, my battery died when we were, uh, no, not my battery. The internet went out when I was reading about Bina. So I'll be sure to go back over that. But yeah, Hakma, the second sphere of the tree of life, represents, is represented by a circle. And that does represent the container of space. So what does he say here? Circle is another component of the yantra. It represents the wheel of life, the circle of life and death. In life and in death, it is the vibrant archetypes of yantras that take us beyond our present state to higher levels of evolution. It is the vibrant archetypes of yantras that take us beyond our per present state to higher levels of evolution. Thus, the wheel of life and death becomes the dimension in which the progression or regression of consciousness and energy is perceived, identified, and experienced. Mm. Hmm. Raziel, the archangel Raziel, represents that function. The wheel of life and death becomes the dimension in which the progression or regression of consciousness and energy is perceived, identified, and experienced. And that is symbolized by the zodiac. That is symbolized by being assigned a particular sign. That's why Hakma is the sphere of karma. So you got to read this, this yoga stuff right alongside with Kabbalah. That's the only way to, well, that's the only way that I, I know to bring out some of these hidden gems. Because you know these Western Kabbalists aren't going to tell you everything. The unfortunate tells her, she says it herself. I'm going to give you this info, which you're barely going to be able to understand. But I'm also not going to give you the, the deep secrets. You're going to have to find that out yourself. Well, here we go. Here we go. You got to read these things in connection to really understand it. And that's exactly what we're doing. Wow. 
visualization of yantra visualization of yantra in the state of deep concentration the visualization of yantras creates a powerful energy field in the mind those who practice trataka fixed gazing on a candle flame will know that the practice makes the mind still even insomniacs can go to sleep easily trataka properly the mind becomes totally focused on the symbol and the mental attitude and mood changes completely Trataka is visual and mental. When you begin to visualize the yantra internally, when the yantra appears in your mind spontaneously, you are entering another dimension of consciousness. It is like moving from the waking state to the dreaming state, from the dreaming state to the pranic state, from the pranic state to the sleeping state. I had a diagram of that recently. I gotta remember where I found it from. Okay. The movement from the waking state to the dreaming state indicates an altered state of consciousness. You are living in the dreaming state, what your senses and mind have experienced in the waking state. Hmm. So it's an altered state of consciousness and you're living in the dreaming state, what your senses and mind have experienced in the waking state. Remember he said that earlier. In the same manner, when you focus on the yantra, an altered state of consciousness is perceived. No one has complete clarity about the use of yantras. However, those who have applied an understanding of yantra in their respective fields have gained many creative benefits. Greetings, Hikate. In Switzerland and France, experiments with yantras were conducted on school children. A yantra coloring book was distributed to young adults. For three to six months in their art classes, they were asked to color in only the yantras and not the things which they normally would have, like houses, trees, mountains, rivers, the sun, the moon, etc. The children were seeing the yantra symbols continuously, and the visualization of the yantra symbols was altering the dissipated pattern in their mind. Whoa. The task of coloring the yantras acted as a meditative process. There you go. So those of you who have said, oh, I don't meditate, but I color and I draw, and that's how I meditate. Guess what? It counts. As long as you're not drawing trees and houses, you gotta draw yantras. <laughs> the children were seeing the yantra symbols continuously, and the visualization of the yantra symbols was altering the dissipated pattern of their mind. The task of coloring the yantras acted as a meditative process, as the children had to focus on the yantra in order to color it in. The effects became evident after three or four months when their grasping, retentive, and expressive abilities showed a major improvement compared with the other children who are painting in normal coloring books. Dr. Jacques Coulon in Switzerland wrote a book in which he states that by painting yantras, the children's powers of retention, ability to grasp information and creative expression show an upward incline. Check that out. Trav, I understand about all that yoga stuff, man. I get all that. But what candle do I use and which demon do I summon? If you're asking me that question, you don't understand all that. Pump your brakes, homies. Finding your yantra. By focusing on the image of a yantra, an external symbol, it is possible to access one's own yantra as the practitioner enters into a deeper level of the mind. In order to discover your own yantra, the map of consciousness, start with something simple, just a dot. Let the yantra build itself up from that. The yantra which builds, the yantra which builds up naturally reflects your state of evolution at that given moment. Ooh, cool. That would explain it. 
I'm telling you, for the past, I don't know, maybe a month or two, before I open my eyes, because I usually sit there and gradually come to a waking state, I don't just jump up out of bed all the time. Usually, I see a, uh, a hexagon figure, clear as day, right in front of me. And I was talking in class, a few other people were seeing uh, something similar. Not, not exactly what I was seeing, but somebody saw like a full cube, someone was seeing something else. But interesting. What does he say here, that sentence there? In order to discover your own yantra, the map of consciousness, start with something simple, just a dot. Let the yantra build itself up from that. The yantra which builds up naturally reflects your state of evolution at that given moment. Often, people just select a yantra because they like it and are attracted to it and start practicing sadhana. You know that the Sri Yantra is a powerful Shakti Yantra, so you use it in meditation. You sit there cross-eyed, looking at the Sri Yantra for months, and then you distance yourself. You enjoyed the practice for a few minutes. You felt calm and peaceful, but that was not your Yantra. You went cross-eyed in the belief that Yantra meditation was going to change your psyche and life instantly. Sounds familiar? Jin Jinny. Peace, peace. Mm. Yantras are maps of consciousness that emerge as you meditate. They are an indication of your progress and growth and your limitations, blocks, and impediments. Yantras are tools of meditation. Yantra actually means an instrument, an apparatus. It is a tool of meditation, a tool for accessing the unconscious and through the unconscious, the superconscious. Okay, so that concludes chapter three of Mantra and Yantra. Quite a lot of information disseminated here. Um, to be quite honest, this goes way deeper than just a couple of patterns on the cover of a book. Quite literally maps of consciousness. Now remember, he talked about there were three different levels of, of symbols, right? And he talks about how, how mantras have a form and a shape. And that's what we call the yantra, the form and the shape that, that these mantras take. And that mantras represent the subtle sound vibration, which is the first manifestation of energy. It's a frequency of vibration, a frequency of consciousness, and a frequency of energy. All right, maybe it's time to sketch a few doodles before we conclude. Just a few, not a lot. you guys learned a thing or two but he talks about how there were three levels of, of symbols the first is sensory inputs all 
All right, so that was level one, sensory input. And what's happening here? So these happen to be different memories. We're talking about the type, the, the data that we are receiving from the five senses, right? The data that we're receiving from our five senses. There's an ear. There's a hand. There's an eye. Taste. There's a nose, all right? So we're pulling in different vibrations. We're pulling in different pieces of data from these five gates, from the ears, from what we, we feel, what we see, what we taste, what we smell. Data is coming in, it's being collected and gathered, and it's being transformed and converted into memories, into memories, memory. This represents the first level of symbol, sensory input. Now these, mem these memories, these events, these inputs, that we gather, they leave impressions in our consciousness. And these impressions can be stored into different archetypes. We've got a nice, clean cut categorization symbol right here to place all of our different archetypes inside of. So all of our experiences are placed into different archetypes. Now what happens is that when we sleep, these pieces of data come back to our awareness through different memories and through different archetypes. So we're experiencing these same symbols in our sleep. The same categorizations of information that we collect with these five senses. They're collected, they're sorted, they're placed into archetypes. And when we go to sleep, we experience them, we relive them. Pretty typical, right? That's the first level of symbol. And also keep in mind, this is also the most basic uh, level of communication that we have with each other. We communicate with each other through the different symbols of speech and sight, taste, smell, touch, etc. All our life, we express ourselves by speech and movement in order to recognize, connect, or describe our perceptions to other people. So our speech, our movement, and the different images that we come up with, they represent the archetypes of the senses and the unconscious mind. So everything, everything that is experienced is stored in the unconscious mind. And it's categorized into these archetypes, into these memories that we collect data from the five senses with. An interesting thing that he says here is it's a lot like a hard drive of a computer. Everything that you put onto your computer is stored on that hard drive. Even if you delete it, it's still etched and embedded into that hard drive. And if you have the right equipment, you can bring that information back up. Well, the same thing is happening with, with the unconscious experience. Everything that comes through these five gates, the ears, the, the sensation of touch, the sight, taste, and smell, everything that enters into your experience is permanently embedded into the unconscious mind. It's all self-contained. It was always there in the first place. But because we're going through time, we're experiencing it as it happens. But it's, it's always been there. That's the only explanation as to why it's permanently embedded, because it has always been there. So that represents the first level of symbol. The next level is represented as nonverbal symbol.
Nonverbal symbols is the second category. So nonverbal symbols are beyond the scope and the range of the senses, and they represent the building blocks of the personality. So this level is sensory input and this is self-contained. That's what, that's what is trying, this is an attempt that I'm making to convey about the indrias, right? The organs of perception and the organs of action, things that can be tasted and taste itself. It's all self-contained. It's two parts of a puzzle. You have a taste organ to taste things. They work together. They exist together. That's all categorized in this first level. So the second level represents nonverbal symbols, which are experiences that are beyond the five senses. So this is not anything that you're going to experience with your physical body. It's nothing that you're going to hear, nothing that you're going to see, taste, touch, or smell. And in any case, these are things that come equipped with us that we didn't receive from our five sense experience. So these things come as the essence of our character, of our nature, of our behavior, of our personality, of our attitude. These are the pre-installed programs. And again, we're still dealing with the concept of archetypes here, but the level is different. First, the external. Now we're dealing with internal archetypes, the building blocks of our very personality. So nonverbal symbols, we're dealing with character, personality, behavior, nature, mentality, attitude. Pre-installed software that comes with your computer. That's the second level of symbols. So these represent your strengths and also your limitations. And these things evolve and unfold through time as, as you begin to, uh, you know, the more that you live. Then of course, there's the third level of symbols which represents transcendental symbols. transcendental symbols. So this third group is beyond the five senses. It's transcendental. It's beyond the five senses and it's beyond even your personal character, right? It's beyond your personal experience. individuality, right? This is bigger than just you, bigger than your personal existence. In the book, it says, these type, this group of symbols, they represent maps of consciousness, yantras, geometric forms that were visualized by yogis in deep states of meditation when they tried to experience and understand the subtle vibrations within their own bodies and the cosmos.
these are going to represent the patterns of existence, the, the, the framework and the structures. In Kabbalah, in specific the Ladder of Lights, we were learning about the four worlds. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was actually a fourth level of yantras that he hasn't touched on here. Because I know there was a fourth level of mantra that he didn't touch on. He just touched on the three. He said there was a fourth type that was pretty much not even worth talking about because nobody reading this book will be able to touch that. I'm pretty sure there's a fourth level of yantra as well. I'll have to look into it, but I'm certain there is. But uh, according to what we learned in the Ladder of Lights, we talked about the four worlds. We talked about the world of Asaya that was pretty much regarding what's happening here. We talked about the world of Yetzirah, which is pretty much what's happening here. And then we talked about the world of Bria, which will correlate with the transcendental symbols. The world of Bria is represented by the archangels. And from what we read in the Ladder of Lights, we found that the archangels represent the stable networks of patterns that uphold the cosmos, it's patterns that do not change, patterns that are literally structures put into place that represent the frameworks of existence. That's what we're tapping into with these transcendental yantras. So for example, Shiva would represent a transcendental yantra. Shiva is, you know, we may symbolize it as a blue man wearing tiger skin, but that's not what Shiva is. That is literally just a logo or an image representing, just like the logo of Coca-Cola is not the soda itself. It's an expression of the essence. Likewise, the symbol of Shiva is, it, it may be a blue man or originally a man with a blue neck because of what he swallowed, a story that goes along with it. But just like any other deity or cosmic essence or angel or whatever, non-physical entity it's a symbol that represents a transcendental essence it represents a principle right so don't get caught up in the surface level interpretation of things when we're dealing with spirituality none of this stuff should be taken at surface level none of it should be taken at surface level no matter which field you belong to whether it's the bible or or whatever none of it should be taken at surface level it has to be described as a symbol because what is actually being talked about is transcendental. That means it's beyond the individuality. It's beyond the five senses. It's deeper. We're talking about archetypes. We're talking about patterns that exist before you, after you, beyond you. All right? But this level of transcendental symbol this represents something that has not yet assumed a material form. It exists, but it, this is something that hasn't formed an expression just yet. We're talking about something that's before the expression. So when you talk about having psychic ability or being able to tack in, tap into different clair, clair senses, whether it's clairaudience, clairvoyance, et cetera, et cetera, this is happening on the transcendental level. This is happening on a level before it manifests by something that can be observed by the five senses. Right, right? Rich Nigga asks, what do you mean by tapping into the subtle vibration? Well, you think about you got subtle and you got gross. Gross, meaning it's very dense. It's very obvious to the five senses. If you talk about gross, the gross vibration is going to be picked up by the ears, by the skin, by the eyes, by the tongue, by the nose. Slow, low vibrating, gross, dense vibrations are going to be obviously picked up by the body apparatus, by the body machine, by the body instrument. Now, you, you have the gross aspect of different things and you've got a subtle aspect of different things. For example, the phone that you're looking at. It's an expression of energy in its gross state. It's vibrating so slow that it's maintaining its form. You can hold it in your hand, you're looking at it. The phone is vibrating, although very slowly. Now check this out. The phone is connected to the internet. It's tapping into Wi-Fi, right? You asked me, uh, what do you mean by tapping into the subtle vibration? Wi-Fi would be an example of a subtle vibration compared to the phone itself. You can't see Wi-Fi 
You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't even hear it because it's subtle. It can't be picked up by the five senses. But the phone is designed in such a way that it can receive that subtle vibration and translate it into something that can be seen. Right? Maybe, and what we're working on right now is being able to translate that same data into something that can be felt and hurt. Well, it can be heard also. It can be seen and heard. They're working on technology right now to transmit that same information so it can be smelled, so it can be tasted. You've seen the videos now where you can lick your screen and taste what's being on the screen. So that subtle vibration is being converted so that it can be experienced by the gross senses. So when I say tapping into the subtle vibration, like you said earlier in this chapter, your, your awareness, it's focused on these five doors of perception. Your awareness is focused on these five doors of perception. In order to be able to perceive subtle vibration, you have to refine your awareness. You have to refine your awareness. Right now, your awareness is dense, it's gross. You can't perceive anything past the five senses. But through practice, through training, and through consistency, you can gradually begin to perceive subtle vibration. You can begin to perceive information that is not readily perceptive through the five gates of the human body. We, we, can, we can taste water. We can see water. We can feel water. Right? You can even hear water flowing and trickling. But that's an expression of, of what what we call water it's not actually water that's just an expression a very gross and dense expression of it but there's a subtle essence behind water we don't quite know what that is we can't see it taste it touch it smell it hear it we can't do none of that when it comes to water but what happens is in order for us to be able to perceive the subtle essence of water we have to come up with a formula they call it h2o we can't see taste smell we don't know what h2 and o is only when those two things come together it becomes a gross expression now, but we can't experience it in its subtle essence, only it's gross. So you literally have to learn how to refine your senses in order to be able to perceive those subtle essences. The same way that the scientists had to create an instrument, they had to create a, a microscope and whatever other tools they used to be able to perceive H2 and O, because they damn sure didn't just look at it. So just like the scientists, the physical scientists have to come up with different instruments that are refined enough to perceive subtle vibrations. In the science of yoga, meditation, tantra, we're working to refine our awareness so that we can perceive subtle vibration. Good question. Okay, so that was a quick recap of Mantra and Yantra. That was a quick uh, study on the book itself. Like I say every single time, y'all, get these books, read these books, study these books. Because this information can change your life, most certainly can. How? Because when you start experiencing this stuff for yourself, how you see the world is not the same. When you begin to tap into the subtle vibration, right? When you begin to see that the external things that you're, you're experiencing with your five senses, these external things, they're not the beginning or the end of anything. They're an after effect of an echo of a copy of something. So the more that you're able to refine your senses, the closer you get to the origin, right? Let me say one more thing and then we're going to wrap it up here. So I can get a couple of rounds in with my with my home slices on this new season of Fortnite. I'm so glad they took away building at least for a week. So check it out. You got an essence of a thing. You got an essence of a thing, right? Here's the essence. There's the essence of it. In its most pure state, that's something in its most pure, refined, uncut, untampered with state. And that doesn't exist in the physical. That doesn't exist in the physical because it's so pure, it hasn't manifested yet. It hasn't become dense yet. But because it exists in its essential form, 
eventually it's gonna express itself in the physical because that's just the way it works. Everything is trickling downward. When you look at these different, uh, when you look at the triangles, the diagram of the tree of life, it's trickling downward, trickling downward. So eventually essence is going to manifest. First, it's gonna to start to form a very, it's gonna form a subtle vibration, you're gonna see it as an astral thing, then it's gonna become an etheric thing, then it's gonna become a physical thing. Nothing ever starts physical, nothing ends physical. It goes back up the food chain. But it begins as an essence, and then eventually, it manifests as an expression. Right? It manifests as an expression. So most people only have, only have the equipment to perceive and decipher the expression of a thing. Right? The expression of a thing, it can be experienced with the with the, the faculty of hearing, the faculty of touching, the faculty of seeing the faculty of tasting the faculty of smelling the expression of a thing can be perceived with these five senses and in a way they're made for each other the fact that you can see it it was built for the eyes it was made it comes as a package together this is your this is your your life your experience everything that you've ever heard touched saw tasted or smelled all of it from beginning to end is self-contained in a little package called your life from beginning to end but check this out Every little thing that you saw, tasted, touched, smelled, da 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 it was an expression of an essence, right? This is why it's so important to study and learn how to meditate, learn how to actually refine your five senses, refine your awareness, I should say, not just your five senses, refine your awareness of experience. Because as you refine your awareness of experience, you learn to perceive closer and closer to the source of that experience. Your life is not the source of your experience. It's the after product. This is the, the throwaway, the dingleberry, right? The dingleberries of existence. What is a dingleberry, somebody asked. A dingleberry is, you know, when a, a, a dog that has a lot of hair on its butt, if it poops, sometimes a piece of a turtle gets stuck in the hair and it just dingles back there, right? That's what, that's in a way what Malkuth is. Malkuth is beautiful. Malkuth is certainly the, the the kingdom but in comparison to the purity of the rest of the states of existence you know look at it as like the human body the food goes in and it becomes digested and processed and by the time it makes its way out here it's not the same way as when it came into the system see the throat there check this out now this represents the throat that's there's another barrier right here which represents the other end of the throat so what comes in here goes out here most people have a very hard time even getting past this barrier so what we experience at this level of consciousness is the expression of an essence so none of this means what it is that's why they say reality is an illusion that's why this is an illusion not because it doesn't exist, not because it's not real, but because what we are experiencing is not in its original state. It's an expression, not the essence. Rich Nigga asks, so is the astral projection experiencing the source? It's closer, it's closer, but it's not the source. It's not the causal plane. The source is happening way up here. The astral, see where I see right here, the astral triangle? You're still down here in Dingleberry territory, right? Now, listen to what I said. Most people don't get past this little line right here, right? It's true. And you, once you've actually done it, once you've actually refined your senses and been able to project and experience the subtle states, once you're able to do it, and you certainly can and will if you keep practicing, you're going to start to see that a lot of these people are just talking out the side of their neck either for views or because they don't know any better. I don't care, it's none of my business. But I, I keep saying this because this, 
This is what I've come to experience from observation. Most people do not get past this level. And not because they cannot, but because just look at attention span. Just look at attention span. Most people cannot focus for, for more than a couple minutes. That in itself will let you know that, um, you know, we're not really doing the work here. But in any case, <laughs> in any case, Stray Panther says, Malkuth is the rose that smells like poo. Oh, man. body must be like a temple. No part of the temple should smell like poo. <laughs> Jin Jenny says the kingdom of the dingleberry. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is what we're dealing with here. So here's the thing though. Everything that you experience in your life is an expression of an essence. How do you get to the essence? Well, you've got to refine your awareness. How do you refine your awareness? Through the practice of mantra and through the utilization of yantra. Through those two tools, you're able to refine your awareness and become gradually more and more familiar with how to experience the essence. So we don't know how to experience that. Here's the thing. You're always experiencing this but you're only aware of this. You're, you're not refined enough to be able to taste that. Just like, just like you got people who can taste different wines and say, oh, fine notes of chocolate and razzleberry, dazzleberry. Like they're able to distinguish all these little tiny nitpicky granular differences after refinement of their senses. The same way a musician can tell if a, a note is off key or off pitch, right? Or, or also how you know, in any of any of the senses, somebody can feel the texture of something, know that it's different. Somebody can can smell and tell if something is off. You know, you can smell if somebody's been drinking or, or smoking like or smoking weed. Right. Say you've never been around weed before in your life. You wouldn't know if, if it came across your nose. But then there's other people who know immediately. Ah, oh, yeah, I know what you just got finished doing. Right. It's called a refinement of of, ex, of ex, a refinement of your awareness. And refinement comes from experience, right? You've got to have an experience. That's where mantra meditation and yantra meditation come into play. It gives you an experience so that you can refine your senses and be aware of how to do these things. And here's the thing. Uh, love, love, love says it upsets me how to realize how hijacked our attention has been. It would be so good for you to move away from the, the dynamic of, of being victimized. It would be so good to move away from that. The world is how it is. You know, your, 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 your attention hasn't been hijacked. You've just been existing in nature. Nature is the way that it is. And, and it's, it's created to manage the animal population. That's how it goes. So when you, when you are finished being part of the animal population, you expand out of that and you gradually become aware of more things. Everything is perfect. There's no hijacking. It just that's just the way it is. The same way a farmer has to put gates around his flock so that the the cows and the sheep don't leave. That that's the same way that society is set up. Government, govern the mind. It's just it's just set up this way. There's no villain, nobody to get mad at. All that stuff is an expression of an essence. Ain't no bad guys, no Illuminati, no reptilians that you need to fight. Right? You not finna fight no damn. You're not, you're not fighting anybody. Go fight yourself. Go fight your shadow. Go fight your bad dreams, right? Go fight your trauma. Don't worry about fighting Bill Gates. Don't worry about fighting. No, no, don't worry about none of that stuff. Work on yourself, right? Manage your energy in the most efficient way. Don't waste your time. You only got so much of it. You know how easy it is to die? Live. Uh, Straight Panther says, can you go over, can you quickly go over Bhakti again? Page 42. For certain. Just so happens that I'm on that page. Let's talk about it. So, tools for transformation. In the Indian tradition, the use of mantra and yantra is synonymous with Bhakti sadhana. As mantra and yantra channel and purify the emotions and create a state of mind in which the aspirant can connect with the object of worship, the ishta. 
Bhakti is a state of mind. There are different states of mind. Jealousy, hatred, love, compassion, greed, arrogance, etc. Similarly, Bhakti is also a state of mind. The other states of mind connect one to the material world, whereas Bhakti connects one with the object of inner identification. So, basically, we're talking about Bhakti, which in, in some way translates to worship, right? Devotion, right? With bhakti, essentially, what we're doing is we're connecting reverently to the expression of a thing in order to penetrate the essence of it. So most people, they're focusing on the expression of the thing because that's as far as their understanding goes. But through bhakti, we're utilizing dharana, and dharana is becoming one with what you're meditating on. To concentrate with, on something so deeply that you bridge the gap between the space between you and it. And you become one with it. And in becoming one with the thing that you're meditating on, you're now able to perceive its subtle essence. You're able to perceive. So bhakti is how you use the five senses. And you charge it. You supercharge it with reverent emotion. You devote your entire now to the thing. You devote your entire now to the thing. And what happens is you cross these barriers to get to the essence of it. That's why... You've got, you know, the grandmas and the elders of the church who are all about Jesus, all about the word, and they're able to still tap into some divine power to manifest their life in the way that it needs to be, to, to cause healing and miracles, et cetera, et cetera. Not because they learned any magic words, but because they're so reverently devoted to the symbol of Christ that they tap into the essence of what Christ represents. That Tifereth energy, that solar logos they're able to tap into the essence of that symbol through reverent, deep devotion. Right? That, and that's why, you know, it's a waste of time to be sitting here beating up on Christians. Because they're doing the work in their own way. Right? Uh, he goes on to say, the scriptures have defined bhakti in many ways. In Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna describes bhakti as a process of positive and qualitative transformation of one's mental, attitudinal life. In fact, all the statements on bhakti emphasize the need to arrest the dissipations of mind and focus it on the object of one's identification. The final state of bhakti is atman nividan, surrender of the self. But its initial stage is positive and qualitative transformation of the gross, lower mind. This is achieved with the help of mantras as they create a connection with the supreme element. Now, for those of us who know about the Antakarana, the supreme element is represented by Mahat, Bhuti. How do we connect with Bhuti? Through, <laughs> through the five channels. We devote ourselves so deeply. And notice, that's the earth element, right? This is the Akasha element. Guess what? There's three levels in between. Earth, water, fire, air, Akasha. No accidents. We do this stuff because symbol speaks to the abstract mind, right? So by using your five senses, you tap into the earth element, the physical manifestation of a thing, the expression of a thing. You tap into the earth element, and then you use that tapping in, that, that dharana, that oneness, and you penetrate into the etheric aspect of it. You penetrate into the astral aspect of it. You penetrate into the... Vishnanamaya, or, or the, 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 the mental aspect of it, till eventually you get to the Akashic aspect of it, which is the essence, right? And beyond that is where Buddhi is. Beyond that is, is, is the, the great principle. What did, he, what did he call it here? Um, the supreme element. The supreme element from which all this stuff comes from. So that, that's bhakti in a nutshell. That's worship in a nutshell. Worship is not being a slave to an idea, it's intentionally connecting with an, a concept or a symbol, intentionally connecting with it, with a symbol, so that you can break into what it actually represents, so that you can perceive the subtle vibration of that symbol, right? Never about the surface level. Let me know if that answers your, your question, Maestro. Let me know if uh, that's what you were asking about. Society Eject says, there's no enemies, just yourself. I can only say it so many times, right? You just, you just got to experience it yourself. Rich Nika says, so, and 
practicing mantra and yantra is basically just doing mantra, just doing magic, focusing on sigils and breath. Right. And that's what I've been trying to say this whole time. This, this is where all that stuff came from. That's what I want to point out. It didn't start with Goetia and sigils and server. It didn't start with that. All those things copied and reinterpreted this original science, which is why I'm focused here. Right. Hecate Goddess says, so they see Christ. Exactly. Exactly. KP says, oh man, this is juicy. I love it. Peace and greetings and welcome, KP. Cool, cool, cool. MC Maestro says, yeah, that helps. Goes back into the body of light to experience the subtler things. Yes, yes. So yeah, this, this is it right here. Like it, this is it. These are the tools. These are the tools, right? This is not the end all be all. There's so much more past this. Please learn, learn this stuff here so that we can get to the real work, right? This is, these are the tools and the equipment and the concepts required to travel up the tree, right? This stuff has to be understood and practiced so that we can do that work that is actually next level, right? Not something that you already heard about, seen. We're trying to go to new territory here. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new up under Tifereth, which means if you want some new stuff, we got to we got to get past this level here. Now, some of y'all are equipped to do that. And those are the ones who I want to meet. But for everybody else, this science will help you have a better grasp on your reality so that you can manage yourself better. Crossing this first invisible barrier right here. You can use mantra and yantra to do that. So that's the real purpose of low magic. That's the real purpose of working with the Goetia and the Shemham Efrash so that you can learn how to cross this abyss, the first abyss. Working with these spirits, it's not about having an army of demons to uh, 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 heal your insecurities. No, it's so that you can learn the science of navigating beyond material plane existence. Okay, so once you've once you had your fill of working with the goetic spirits or whatever spirits and you learn, okay, I can actually expand my consciousness past the five senses. Now you start to become aware of the etheric plane. You start to get intimate with the etheric plane. You start to understand what it's all about. How to use your imagination for real. Not just daydreaming about Dragon Ball and Naruto, but how to use those expressions of Goku and Sasuke and what's the, what's the bad guy that everybody loves um, with the long black hair and the dark eyes. The villain dude. What's his name? What's his name? Anyway, not just not just post pictures of him on your social media, but to understand the essence of what that represents, right? Madara, thank you, Gerald. Right? Last year it was uh, Thanos, right? And, and the year before that, you know what I'm saying? Like we Cthulhu, right? We've all got these badass nightmare entities that we try to symbolize and say in a tongue in cheek way, oh, that's me. That represents me, right? And that's cool. But when we start to understand the essence of that expression, now you're tapping into the juice of it. You know, so instead of doing, um, what's it called? Um, infinite, infinite Sukiyomi, right? Now you, now you can really start working with the essence of that. Because all these things are symbols. And guess what? They exist on the etheric plane. You know this. You know this. <laughs> Gerald Sombright says, oh, the Thanos era. What a time. <laughs> Oh, the Thanos era. Never forget. We, we lost a couple of troops in that era. Never forget. We lost a couple back then. You know what I'm saying? But their, but their contribution to the work will never be forgotten. Oh, my goodness. The Thanos era. How many of y'all got a Thanos glove? How many of y'all posted your Thanos glove on Instagram? Love, love, love says, so once you penetrate to the essence... You can then easily see it reflected back in the material plane, whether it's distorted or not. Right. But get, And the distortion comes from you. The distortion comes from your ego. The distortion comes from your memories. The distortion comes from your attachment. So it's always being reflected. But it becomes distorted based on your memory. So that's why it's so important to pr practice non-attachment. It's our attachment that causes the distortion. Um, but the essence, it's always there. Once you become aware of it, and learn how to drop and dissolve and become non-attached to your memory, to your personality, to your ego, 
Not only can you see it clearly, but you can begin to pick, choose, modify, and work with specific essences to cause specific expressions. This is how you're able to use magic to affect your life. Now you can effortlessly tap into certain essences to cause certain expressions. All right? This is how we do it. Anybody can do it with practice. And you just learn to get better and better and better and better at it. I'm learning how to get better and better and better and better at it. All right? Rich Nega says, so how do we get to Tifereth or higher by focusing on these symbols? Well, like, like what I said earlier about um, becoming non-attached. Because all those attachments is what keeps you identified with this plane of consciousness. Personality, I am this, I am that, I hate this. We got to fight the Illuminati. We got to fight the, the reptilian. All that stuff is Malkuth level. Because it's identification with expressions of matter. So when we learn how to realize ourselves beyond the five senses, this is this can only be done through introspective meditation. As you begin to spend time in stillness, you begin to see that all that stuff belongs to the material plane. The higher you go, the more you realize you can't take it with you. You absolutely can't take none of that trash up here. That's what Doth is all about. You try to cross this abyss with any of that nonsense, you're coming right back down. Right? This is the throat. This is the anus. You try to take that stuff up here, you get swallowed and shat back out. Get thee behind me, Satan. Shaitan. 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 Shit. Soot. That's what the devil is. Not a red man with horns and goat legs. Satan. Shaitan. Shaitan represents the, the shit of the cosmos. God's shit. When Christ said, get thee behind me, Satan... That wasn't just a cool little thing that he was literally saying, I shit upon you. That's what that translates to in, in the vernacular of the time. I shit upon you. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what that meant. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Another reason not to identify with the dingleberry level of consciousness. It sounds funny, but that, that's literally what this all means. As you can see, it, this is in the shape of a human body. So all God made man in his image. All the functions of the cosmos are the same functions of man. God takes a poop, and it's called Satan. It's called the material plane. This ain't nothing new. You heard this before. No, it's not bad or good. That's just what it is. Everyone has to poop. Pooping isn't evil. It's it's annoying. But it's it, that's what happens when you eat. If you don't want to poop, then don't eat. Oh, but you want to live, right? So you got you to gotta choose your battles, right? <sighs> but in any case, let us continue. Let us continue. <laughs> Them Thanos YouTubers got snapped out of existence. That's funny. Al Dickey, thank you for the donation, brother. What's going, Louis? What's going on? All right, you guys. This was a great, great experience. I love it. Like I said, I would do this all day, every day, but my real world friends are getting sleepy and I do want to get some dubs. I want to get some crowns. So I'm about to go jump on Fortnite for a minute. I hope you guys learned an awful lot, because I actually did. This is good. This is good. It's not enough to just read it and talk about it. You got to live it. You got to prove it to yourself. It's not enough to just repeat it. Don't repeat nothing I said. Right? Don't repeat nothing I said and said Trav said it. No. Go do it. Go practice it. Go test it out. That way, because see, everything I'm saying is an expression. When you, when you follow what I'm pointing to, when you, when you follow what Swami Niranjana Nanda Saraswati is pointing to, you start to get to the essence of what he's talking about. You start to get to the essence of what Dion Fortune is talking about. You start to get to the essence of what William G. Gray is talking about. You start to get to the essence of what Gareth Knight is talking about, etc., etc., ad nauseum. You get to the essence of it. That way, when you express it, it's going to come out in your language. You don't have to copy my words. You don't have to copy nothing I said. If you test it out, if you sit down and meditate, if you do Chiasterium, Chakra Shudi, 
right? If you do like these specific meditations, you're going to tap into the essence and you can talk about it in your own way, right? There's no memorizing of any phrases or terms. You just, you just know what it is. Like I, I haven't memorized none of this. I just know what I'm talking about it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. Hmm. That's that. I'm going to go ahead and roll out and try to get these easy dubs while building is taken off. kind of funny how Fortnite always like uh their storyline kind of lines up with real world events right now there's tanks and there's warfare going on and i think in one day they raised like 35 million dollars for ukraine support it's amazing what he, what emotional attachment can do but um yeah like i said i hope you guys learned something please get this book if you don't have it it's, it's definitely worth your money if you are a spiritual student and you take this stuff Every book that I've ever told you about is worth the money, if you're serious. I'm, I don't get no kickbacks from none of this. You have not seen me post not one single solitary Amazon link, right? Because I don't, I don't care about that. I care about you getting this information. And by the way, the next book that we're reading is Jnana Yoga. We have one more chapter of Mantra and Yantra. <clears throat> one more chapter. After that, we're diving into this. Okay, we're diving into this. Please get this book because it's going to get even more intense if you think this one was good wait till you get to jnana yoga we get into the real meat and potatoes along with it all right y'all playing yeah, just one just one yeah. who's lobby y'all got four okay good i'm about to jump on but yeah you, you can tell it's gonna be a serious one look at look look at the light work look at the lighting it's dramatic that's how you can tell, all right? So yeah, I'm, I'm about to get some of these some of these dubs, and I hope you guys have a good night. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you all. On Sunday we will have a full live stream. I'm jumping in, soldier. All right, all right. Feels good. Feels good. check it out thank you all thank you all thank you all <laughs> all right Louis says Fortnite is trash I mean you know it's not the best game in the world but I like it all right, y'all. Have a good night. Have a good night. This is TK Trav, aka Travis Mages, here with LVX777. I love you guys, and I mean it. Peace. Shari Berry Shar Bay. Peace, peace. CC, peace, peace. Have a good night. Oh, my goodness. Peace. Jen Jenny, have a good night. Alicia M, have a good night. 